I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. We all get angry sometimes. Some of us more than others. Some of us are lucky enough to almost never feel anger. Now, brief anecdote, I have a small car and I drive this small car across the country for, you know, Mormon history conferences and other conferences and whatnot. For those in the know, my car is a first-generation Miata. For everybody else, picture the smallest car you've ever seen, and that's a pretty fitting comparison. It's great. It's convertible, and that makes it the perfect Seattle summer cruiser and a pretty great road tripper car, if only the trunk space was a little bit bigger to fit more books when I go to these conferences. During one of our first cruises in the Miata... Annie and I were enjoying the sunshine and blasting some music, not a care in the world. Then a person in a massive SUV with a commanding view of the road simply didn't see us and pulled out in front of us. Cue slamming on the brakes and honking the horn and loud cursings at the carelessness of the ignorant driver who continued down the road completely unaware of our existence. After that, my fiance Annie... Um, well, by the time you're hearing this, uh, my wife, Annie, said, we're going to get a roll bar for this car. So, you know, in order to make it so we're less certainly dead the next time that something like that happens. We felt anger. We were mad because that person did something that literally threatened our lives. We weren't just inconvenienced by them. We were in actual danger, which evoked an immediate response that we had little control over. The danger was averted and, you know, we calmed down and we took actions to prevent that threat from becoming a mortal danger in the future. With only rare exceptions, we all feel angry from time to time. The stimuli are different for each of us, but the feeling inside is the same. We all act differently once that anger boils up. With that said, anger has an evil twin, wrath. Anger is in response to something that happens to us, a fleeting emotion that can be mitigated and, you know, compensated for. Wrath is deeper. Wrath drives us from feeling mad to seeking vengeance. Wrath is what remains when the anger evaporates and we want retribution. Millennia of myths and folklore revolve around the spirits of those who die in anger. The wrath of those spirits will haunt us to the third and fourth generation as their blood cries out from the ground upon which they were slain. Anger makes us want to hurt somebody for a wrong committed against us or our loved ones. Wrath makes us plot that person's death. It's an ugly side of the human condition, but to deny that it exists is to ignore a monster living within each and every one of us. Empires are built by dictators with a penchant for retribution against any person who harmed them or threatens their lust for power. Even the perfect Jesus violently threw the money changers out of the temple and cursed a tree for apparently not being in the season thereof and then said, I came not to bring peace on earth, but a sword. Joseph Smith died in a gunfight and long shall his blood which was shed by assassins, stain Illinois while the earth lauds his fame. For a young man growing up in a home with scarce resources, sometimes anger, you know, tantrums, outrage, that would get him what he needed to survive. However, the young boy, Joseph Smith, also had a great deal of violence inflicted upon him at a tender and a very impressionable age. From 1811 to 1814, there was a horrible typhoid epidemic. All seven children in the Smith family caught the disease, but Joe and his sister Sophronia were the worst afflicted of the family. 
Sophronia was catatonic for nearly three months, and Joe developed horrible, painful abscesses in his shoulder and in his left leg. The abscesses in his leg became infected, and a group of doctors from Dartmouth Medical College suggested that the leg be amputated to save his life. This was a sentence to vagrancy in the 19th century. The Smiths didn't want to amputate, so one of the doctors, a surgeon named Nathan Smith, suggested an experimental procedure to just remove the infected portion of the bone. To this, the Smith family agreed. According to Joe's mother, seven-year-old Joseph Smith refused to drink alcohol as a sedative for the operation. Instead, he asked his father to hold him down during the surgery and his mother to leave the room. Nathan Smith was apparently an outstanding you know, surgeon, in fact, probably the only person in America who could have saved Joe's life at this time. And the surgery was successful. Dr. Smith removed nine pieces of bone and 14 more worked their way out of Joe's leg before it fully healed. In his book, The Sword of Laban, Joseph Smith and the Dissociated Mind, surgeon Bill Moraine argues that this extremely traumatic and extremely painful surgery during Joe's childhood may have been the source of a lot of his later violent fantasies. To quote Dr. Moraine, quote, Most of all, Joseph would have feared the amputation knife, that foot-long, sword-like instrument whose design had not appreciably changed in the hundreds of years since the primitive barber surgeons. Most surgical instrument kits carried two or even three. That sword, its pain, and its ultimate purpose had haunted his dreams and daytime fantasies since it had first and for the second time been plunged into his leg. The sword would not cease occupying those fantasies ever, end quote. Dr. Moraine also notes that it's almost impossible for Joseph to have been as calm as Lucy describes in her biographical sketches, except in one very specific condition. This sort of a calm, quote, is typical of children who suffer repeated bouts of terrible trauma, that they may enter into a kind of trance or self-hypnosis that protects against the emotional experience of the horror, end quote. This self-induced trance is called dissociation, and it's the same sort of trance that shamans and mediums enter into in order to commune with this, what they perceive as the spirit world. If Joseph's childhood trauma taught him this skill of basically putting himself in a trance, a dissociation, then he could have used that skill later in his life for a kind of lucid dreaming in order to produce visions and revelations. Such a, you know, mental protectionism, a survival mechanism can also cause memory loss for the child who experiences that trauma such that they're unable to actively recall the event, but other events later in their life may trigger those memories unpredictably. After the traumatic leg surgery, Joe went to live for a while with his uncle Jesse in Salem, Massachusetts in order to recuperate by the sea where they thought that the air was more healthy. According to Dr. Moraine again, quote, it was probable in his exile at the seashore that the fantasies began, projected from within by an unspeakable horror he could not recall. As will be seen, these included huge, violent fantasies. Fantasies of war, fantasies of people in chaos who escape to the seashore, fantasies of magic swords that dismember heads and arms, fantasies of sons overthrowing fathers, princes killing kings, righteous killing unrighteous, fantasies of towers, trees, serpents, flaming swords, pillars, cigar-shaped boats, sickles, and stiff-necked people, fantasies of evil men brought to humiliation by young heroes. Fantasies of good fathers and evil fathers, of faithful women and whores. Fantasies of good armies and bad armies pushing one another to and fro like battles of ants. Fantasies of betrayal. Fantasies of darkness, of magic stones that light up the darkness. Fantasies of good white people and evil black people, of good white people becoming evil black people. Fantasies of princes being bound with cords, of blood on garments, of maggots eating flesh. Fantasies of destroying angels with drawn swords. The fantasies would flood out of his unconscious in hundreds of repetitive dreams and nightmares, in daydreams, in random sequences, in play, in speech, 
and in silence. They took over the inner life of Joseph Smith Jr. as an automatic pilot takes over an aircraft. In this state, he limped into his future, end quote. Simply put, a young boy going through a traumatic experience like this leg operation would have forever shaped his mind by this experience, even if he was unable to remember what actually took place. The survival mind created by this and other traumatic childhood experiences would emerge periodically throughout Joe's life and ministry. Episode 68. Fast forward now to 1827, and Joe supposedly got the Golden Book of Mormon plates. After Joe pulled the plates out of the ground, he claimed to have stashed them in a tree or in a log somewhere in the forest. Ten days later, rumor around the neighborhood said that somebody had apparently found and taken possession of Joe's fabled gold plates. As soon as Emma told Joe about these rumors, Joe apparently drank some tea and then ran into the woods and got the plates from the log. He wrapped them up in his jacket, and then he started walking home with the gold plates under his arm. Now, remember, these plates were supposedly made from gold. If you run the numbers on their reported dimensions, they'd weigh about 230 pounds. Now, Joe later allowed several people to lift the plates while they were wrapped up in a cloth or they were sitting inside of a wooden box used uh, for chipping glass, a glass box, one might say. And these witnesses, the people who actually lifted the plates, reported that the plates were more like 40 to 60 pounds. That means that our best guess says that Joe had a prop, plates, a set of plates that were made out of sheet metal like tin or something that, that was light. That would explain how he could, you know, carry them home under his arm and others could lift and move the plates without struggling with 200 plus pounds of gold. Now, I don't know how much lifting weights you've done, dear listener, but it's pretty easy to tell the difference between 60 pounds and 230 pounds. With that said, however, the next part is pretty tough to believe. According to Joe, as he was walking home with the plates under his arm, he was attacked by three guys in the woods. The first one sprung out from behind a tree and hit Joe on the back of the head with the butt of a gun. Walking through the woods and somebody unexpectedly hitting you in the back of your skull with a hard object, those are ingredients for a concussion and brain damage. But... Joe was able to stay on his feet, and he turned to face his attacker, attacker and knocked the attacker down with the unoccupied arm that wasn't carrying the plates. You know, God power infused mega punch, right? And at that point, Joe began to run home at top speed with the 230 pound plates under his arm. Then a second man attacked him, but Joe knocked this guy out with another one armed mega punch infused with God power presumably while he was still running at top speed with the 230-pound gold plates under his arm. It sounds unbelievable, right? But then, as Joe neared his home, a third attacker appeared from behind him. This person hit Joe on the back of the head with the butt of a gun again. But again, Joe was unfazed by the blow, and he turned around and issued yet another God-infused mega punch of doom for the night. He knocked this dude down like the other guys, but this time Joe actually incurred some of his own damage from the hit. He dislocated his thumb, which he apparently asked Big Daddy Cheese, his own dad, you know, Joseph Smith Sr., to reset for him once he got home. That's episode nine. This helps to contextualize what Dr. Moraine meant with that passage about Joe having violent fantasies for the rest of his life. Now, maybe some form of altercation took place in the woods that night, but we can clearly see how such an altercation turned into a legend in Joe's mind almost immediately. He was his own hero with a thousand faces. Now that Joe had the plates, you know, he that he probably manufactured and sequestered in the forest for a brief time, he started to author the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is a pretty violent book. We could spend all day talking about the violent stories contained in the pages, whether it's Ammon cutting off the arms of the Lamanites who were trying to have a little fun scattering flocks of sheep, uh, or the Nephites killing enough Lamanites to build a bridge from their bodies, or Moroni imprisoning and murdering thousands of political dissidents. 
or Helaman, grinding through army after army of Lamanites while not losing a single of his own soldiers, like entire cities burned down or you know, <laughs> being buried by mountains or entire cities sinking into the ocean like Atlantis or something when Jesus was crucified. Millions of soldiers murdering each other down to the last dozen men. Human sacrifices, burnt offerings. There's absolutely no shortage of just deplorable atrocities within the Book of Mormon. But I want to focus on one story that's unequivocally autobiographical and reveals the inner workings of Joe's mind better than basically any other story in the Book of Mormon. And this is the story of Nephi and Laban. Nephi is a sort of main character in the first part of the Book of Mormon. He and his family sail from, you know, Vermont to New York, sorry, uh, from Israel to America, where Nephi becomes a king and a prophet historian for the Book of Mormon. Before they leave, though, Nephi's dad, Lehi, has a vision that God wants the family to steal a set of brass plates engraved with a copy of the Torah from a rich guy in town named Laban. So in keeping with this vision, Nephi creeps up to Laban's house in the middle of the night. And this is the third attempt. Now, as Nephi comes near Laban's house, he sees a drunk guy lying on the ground and he recognizes him as Laban. Now, Laban has a sword that's sheathed at his hip with a gold hilt and a steel blade. The Holy Spirit whispers to Nephi that he should draw the sword and cut off Laban's head. In this story, Nephi hesitates because he's never killed anyone before. And let's face it, like a passed out drunk guy doesn't really pose any kind of a threat. But the spirit says that Laban is a bad guy and that the book of brass plates is rightfully yours, Nephi. And it's for the greater good. So Nephi draws the sword from Laban's side and chops off his head. Now, here the story kind of falls apart because Nephi... He's cut off this guy's head. Then his clothes would be drenched in blood, right? And probably vomit from being passed out drunk. But Nephi takes the clothes off of Laban, puts them on himself, and then somehow successfully impersonates Laban in order to get the brass plates from Laban's servant named Zoram. Now, not only would his disguise be drenched in bodily fluids, but his voice and his face wouldn't match Laban's either. So I'm not sure exactly how this part of the story makes any sense, but maybe it's just supposed to be a miracle, right? The gift of tongues and faces, you know, a thousand faces or something like that. Or maybe it's just childish writing by a 24 year old who knows nothing about how the world works. But anyway, you see how Dr. Moraine is getting at what he talks about with Joe having violent fantasies that involve swords. This story also gives us some insight into Joe's sense of morality. If someone has something you want and God gives you permission, then you can kill them to get it, even if that person is helpless and drunk. Oddly enough, the story of Laban is often taught in church, especially to little kids, that no matter what God commands— you must carry out God's will. Now, for any of you with, you know, believing family members, you know, Mormon family, the story of Laban can present lots of fun exercises about human morality and how far a person is willing to go with their religious convictions. Ask that person, that believing Mormon, hey, you know, if a voice in your head told you that, you know, maybe Sonia Johnson or Sam Young were enemies of the gospel, would you kill them? You All you have to go on is a voice in your head. Would you kill that person because they're an enemy to the church? Now, in presenting this hypothetical, you may have to massage the scenario a little bit, right? Like you may have to work it to be like, you know, if the prophet showed up with God at your doorstep telling you that Mike Norton has revealed the secrets of the temple and therefore broken his covenant, would you blood atone this evil man? Or, you know, maybe leave it up to them to dictate the parameters. What would it take for you to murder somebody because God told you to? Or, you know, just skip these hypotheticals and just find some desert nationalists on Twitter and see what fantasies they're furiously masturbating over. Now, once we transition from the New York era into the Kirtland era of the church, we get to see how Joe dealt with real-life enemies who posed actual threats to him in some way, instead of just 
you know, fantasies about fighting off three grown men in the forest while running with 230 pounds of gold. Joe made his way to the city of Curland in early 1831, where the congregations of Hinchman Sidney Rigdon had converted to his church, thanks to the first missionaries who passed through Curland in autumn of 1830. Episodes 14, 15, 24, and 25. An existential threat to the prophet presented itself in September of 1831 in the form of Joe's second-in-command himself. Hinchman Sidney Rigdon was preaching in Kirtland one day and announced to the congregation that, quote, the keys of the kingdom were taken from us, end quote. Now, this is according to the autobiograph, uh, the autobiography of Philo Dibble, uh, or Dibble Dabble, as we called him many moons ago. On hearing that the keys had been taken away, quote, Many of his hearers wept, and when someone undertook to dismiss the meeting by prayer, he said, praying would do them no good, and the meeting broke up in confusion, end quote. Well, Joe's older brother, Hiram, went and told Joe what Sidney had just said about the keys being taken, and Joe gathered all of the saints together in a barn and announced, quote, I can contend with wicked men and devils, yes, with angels. No power can pluck those keys from me except the power that gave them to me. That was Peter, James, and John. But for what Sidney Rigdon has done, the devil shall handle him as one man handles another, end quote. The meaning of Joe's threat to have the devil handle Rigdon became clear about three weeks later when Rigdon was lying in bed alone, quote, an unseen power lifted him from his bed, threw him across the room, and tossed him from one side of the room to the other. The noise being heard in the adjoining room, his family went in to see what was the matter and found him going from one side of the room to the other, from the effects of which Sidney was laid up for five or six weeks, end quote. So to trace the sequence of events, Hinchpin Sidney Rigdon, Joe's second-in-command at the time, preached that the keys were taken— Joe said, no, they aren't, and the devil will deal with Sidney the way that a man handles another. Then Rigdon gets beat within an inch of his life, and then he publicly repented after publicly attributing the beating to an invisible force. By the way, Joe had a long reputation for fighting as a kid, and he was in his mid-twenties here. Rigdon had no such history, instead spending more of his time with books than with people, and he was nearing his 40s at this time. Episodes 25 and 26. A little over a year later, at a Sunday meeting on July 8, 1832, Joe demanded that Hinchpin Rigdon surrender his priesthood li license because Rigdon had once again claimed that the keys of the kingdom were lost and that he alone, that Rigdon alone, retained the keys. It's almost like you, when we see these these pieces of evidence, it's almost like the keys themselves were real physical objects that could be given and taken away instead of some ethereal concept that how they're treated in the church today. Eh, you know, that's a brief tangent. But apparently three weeks after this little tissy fit between Joe and Rigdon, Rigdon was reinstated into the church presidency without the horrible beating as a rite of passage like it happened in uh, late 1831. This time, Joe was a little smarter with his response. Instead of reacting with violence, he secured his claim on the priesthood keys by dictating to a scribe the first ever written account of his first vision, in which God appeared to him at the age of 16 and told him that the world had turned away from God and that the end was near and gave him the priesthood keys. That's episode 28. Now, these are power plays. And while these power plays were underway in Kirtland and Joe was trying to consolidate his power, the Missouri church was dealing with some troubles of their own. Missouri in the church there is going to be a central focus of our episode today. The conflict between the Mormons and the Missourians started in July of 1833. The Missourians banded together and gave the saints an ultimatum that they needed to clear out of Jackson County, Missouri. Now, there were several reasons for this. For one thing, about 1,200 Mormons had moved into Jackson County, and they were on the verge of being able to take political control of the government. For another thing, the Mormons were mostly anti-slavery Yankees, and the Missourians were Southern slave-holding Democrats, and they were afraid that the Mormons 
would bring free blacks into the state and then stir up the Missourians slave to rebellion. You know, having a bunch of abolitionists in Missouri government would only exacerbate these tensions. The Book of Mormon also prophesied that the natives would wipe out the white people in a bloody apocalypse, and the Missourians worried that the Mormons might try to make this prophecy come true, which is totally reasonable because the whole reason the Mormons made their way to Missouri in the first place was to preach to the nearby native reservations in Caw Township. The Missourians ended up forming a mob. They burned the church's printing office and a bunch of haystacks and grain fields owned by the Mormons, and they told the Mormons to get out or there'd be even worse treatment that would happen. The situation escalated in October and November of 1833, and a few men were killed or wounded in an exchange of gunfire. The Missouri's governor intervened and then negotiated a truce between the two sides, giving the Mormons basically 10 days to clear out of Jackson County. Not all the Missourians abided by this treaty, and the Mormon refugees ended up being routed by armed gangs as they evacuated uh, the settlement, the Mormon settlement there in Jackson County. This expulsion from Jackson County, let's face it, this was awful. This is not right, and it posed a huge problem for the church itself. You see, Jackson County had been chosen by God as the site of the New Jerusalem and the, the, the Latter-day Saint Temple, that was by revelation. God wouldn't get such a dire matter wrong, could he? The Missourians knew this. The Mormons knew this, that this was their, the ground zero for Zion, the New Jerusalem. And there wasn't really an out for Joe here because he made this declaration. It looked pretty bad for Joe to just like, you know, choose some other site or say that God, you know, got it wrong in the first place when he declared that Jackson County, Missouri was Zion. Instead, Joe decided on a military strategy, establishing a pattern which would serve and enslave him for the rest of his ministry. At a meeting of the Kirtland High Council on February 24th, 1834, just about four months after the Mormons were kicked out of Jackson County, Missouri, quote, Brother Joseph then arose and said that he was going to Zion to assist in redeeming it by military force, is the implication. He called for the voice of the council to sanction his going, which was given without a dissenting voice. He then called for volunteers to go with him, when some 30 or 40 volunteered to go, who were present at the council. It was a question whether the company should go by water or by land, and after a short investigation, it was decided unanimously that they go by land. Joseph was nominated to be the commander-in-chief of the armies of Israel and the leader of those who volunteered to go and assist in the redemption of Zion, end quote. By the time they left, Joe ended up gathering about a hundred young men and a bunch of, uh, you know, baggage or supply wagons. Because the wagons were full of supplies, the soldiers mostly traveled on foot for this thousand-mile journey. Understandably, this caused some complaining on the part of the soldiers. They would later be joined by another contingent, bringing their total numbers to just over 200 people, including 10 women, 10 women and a child who was apparently along for who knows what reason. This is the story of the ill-fated Zion's Camp, episodes 30 and 31. During this trip, one man that seemed to, to be a dissenting voice throughout the entire military campaign was named Sylvester Smith, no relation to Joseph Smith. Whether he was the only dissenting voice or was just like the most vocal out of the bunch of dissenting voices, that doesn't really matter because he became the poster boy or maybe the whipping boy for murmuring against the prophet. One example given includes Sylvester complaining about the disgusting food that Zion's camp had to eat, while Joe happened to enjoy the best food, of course. Joe responded that an evil spirit had come over the camp, and the next day, every horse of every single man that was murmuring, quote, was so badly foundered that we could scarcely lead them a few rods to water, end quote. But, according to the history of the church, once everybody stopped their murmuring, all of the horses healed up from the foundering by noon that day, except for Sylvester Smith's horse, which died the next day. Yeah, you know, Joseph Smith was petty enough to kill a horse out of spite, even though there isn't any direct evidence of it. Now, quick side note. 
Zion's camp is also when Zelf, the white Lamanite warlord, was unearthed and Joe gave a revelation who declared Zelf's identity. It's just a fun little tidbit of Mormon history. As Zion's camp proceeded, the murmuring increased and their trials also increased. And Joe prophesied that the camp would be scourged by God unless they repented. This was, however, written looking back on the events after they happened. So Joe could basically make any version of it look like he delivered a prophecy that came true. On June 4th to 5th of 1834, they crossed the Mississippi River and Joe's dog either growled at or bit Sylvester Smith, which only exacerbated the tensions and served as kind of a microcosm of Joe's terrible leadership. According to Heber C. Kimball's journal, Joe heard about this whole dog and Sylvester Smith incident and declared that if a dog had growled at him, he would have shown the dog who the master was. The implication, of course, was that Sylvester was a dog who had growled at Joe and Joe intended on disciplining him. Sylvester Smith, of course, replied that, quote, if that dog bites me, I'll kill him. Joe retorted, if you kill that dog, I'll whip you, end quote. And then Joe ended up preaching to the whole Zion's camp about how wicked Sylvester's behavior was. You know, I think it says something about Joe that he values his own dog more than the soldiers marching a thousand miles in lockstep behind his own military leadership. As the Mormons finished their river crossing uh, during science camp, Luke Johnson rode up and warned that the Missourians had 400 men ready to ride out and meet the army of the saints, outnumbering them two to one. This somehow emboldened the Mormons, and they did some drilling and military exercises as a bit of posturing. On June 16th, the citizens of Jackson County proposed a peaceful settlement, but the Mormons refused. Because Joe was a military leader. He was flexing some muscles here. He had an entire army. He was armed to the teeth with guns and bowie knives. He wanted to see what they could do. The march resulted in, of course, rumors and falsely in inflated numbers. And newspaper articles and word of mouth claimed that a thousand Mormon men armed and ready for battle were descending on Jackson County, which really amped up the pressure of peace arrangements between the Mormons who had been removed from Jackson County and the anti-Mormon Missourians. However, the whole time that Joe was marching to Missouri with his army, Double Dub Phelps, Algernon Sidney Gilbert, and party boy Edward Partridge were in constant contact with Governor Dunklin of Missouri and other officials to try and resolve everything peaceably while Science Camp was descending onto Jackson County. Governor Dunklin appointed John F. Ryland to basically oversee these peaceful negotiations, and Ryland tried to get the Mormons to sell their land in Jackson County and to move to the adjacent Clay County, to the little town of Liberty. Double Dub Phelps and Algernon Sidney Gilbert continually refused this compromise, claiming that it was unfair to the people who had been chased out of their homes that previous November because their land had essentially been stolen from them. One of the primary sticking points in all these peace negotiations with the Missourians and the Mormons here wasn't so much the land, but also guns and goods. In running the Mormons out of their homes, the mob disarmed them and stole all of their stuff, especially their guns. Of course, today, like, you know, you and I can go buy a gun for a couple hundred bucks at a pawn shop, maybe cheaper if we buy it from a guy who's selling guns out of the back of his van in a parking lot. But in the frontier days, a man's gun was an investment and in many cases, his livelihood. The mob took 52 guns and one pistol from the Mormons, which the Mormons were, let's just say, perturbed about, possibly even more so than their other possessions and their land being stolen or destroyed. That shouldn't minimize the importance of the land, though. The guns were a problem, yeah, but they could also be replaced by reparations or just be returned. The land itself, though, was Zion. It was holy land to the Mormons, valued more than any other land and saw, you know, more value in than like their non-Mormon neighbors. The Mormons valued the land in Jackson County more than the non-Mormons who actually lived there before the Mormons, you know, flooded into the county. Now, as a result of this, Joseph Smith would end up weaponizing 
the the land in Zion, and he would actually excommunicate people like Double Dub Phelps for selling their Zion land. After which, Joe himself would turn around and do the same exact thing in order to help finance the settlement in Illinois after the Missouri Mormon War, which we're going to talk about the Missouri Mormon War extensively on today's podcast. Meanwhile, during all this conflict in Zion's camp was coming in, uh, things started to look worse for Zion's camp expedition itself. Just as several hundred Missourians threatened to meet the Mormons in battle, some members of the camp started to come down with cholera. At the end of it all, 14 men ended up dying of cholera, and Joe himself ended up coming down with it. And Joe knew that he couldn't fight the Missourians with an army that's stricken by cholera, so he received his convenient fishing river revelation. Quote, Therefore, in consequence of the transgressions of my people, blaming the victims who were stricken by cholera, it is expedient in me, meaning God, that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion, end quote. On July 8th, after losing 14 people to cholera, never firing a single shot at an enemy, starving and thirsting nearly to death many times and scaring a whole lot of people that thought there would be a huge shootout resulting from Zion's camp and just generally making things much worse than they were before Zion's camp march, Joseph and the majority of the elders left Missouri without actually redeeming Zion or resolving any of the conflict. Notably as well, one of the people who was negotiating the resettlement with the Missourians also owned a store in Independence, which also served as the bishop's storehouse there. As he was negotiating with the Missourians, Science Camp decided to stay on his property while the leadership decided kind of what to do and, and dealt with the cholera outbreak. This man himself came down with cholera brought by the soldiers and died. Algernon Sidney Gilbert became one of the first Mormons to actually die for the cause due solely to the incompetence of Joseph Smith. After Zion's camp and upon their return to Kurland, Sylvester Smith, the, the guy who was murmuring the whole time during the Zion's camp, accused Joseph Smith of criminal actions, the details of which don't seem to exist. In reaction, a disciplinary council was held for Sylvester Smith, not Joseph Smith, who was persuaded to basically publish a confession that admitted fault under that he signed under duress. Three weeks later, in response to all of this, and, and once the fury had died down, Sylvester published a statement that rescinded his confession to the, that fault. And three days after that, another disciplinary council was called, and Sylvester signed another confession, once again under duress, out of fear of punishment. Even in utter humiliation and defeat from this Zion's camp debacle, Joe somehow managed to control the narrative, blame Sylvester Smith for the cholera, and crush Sylvester Smith's descent. Episode 32. I, I, the more I study Joseph Smith, the more I learn, never underestimate the power of a narcissistic tyrant with a god complex. Fast forward uh, in, in 1835 and 1836, Joe ended up getting into fights with some members of not church leadership like Sylvester Smith, but of his own family that are worth just discussing kind of briefly here. The first of these fights was with his brother-in-law, Calvin Stoddard, in June of 1835. According to the Painesville Telegraph on June 22nd, 1835, the prophet was put in jail on a charge of assaulting Stoddard, but Stoddard initially couldn't be obtained as a witness because the good Mormon that he was, he had, quote, been suddenly induced to leave the state, end quote. Now, eventually, the court got a hold of Sylvester, uh, of, <laughs> of Calvin Stoddard, not Sylvester Smith. I'm, I'm mixing up my anti-Mormons here who are, you know, just dissenters within the cause. Eventually, the court got a hold of Calvin Stoddard and made him testify to the facts. And according to testimony from Stoddard and from Joe's own mother, Lucy Mac Smith, Stoddard and Joe eventually got into an argument over whether or not there was water under a certain lot of land. 
Stoddard said there was water, while Joe said there wasn't water. And Joe called <laughs> Stoddard, sorry, called Joe a quote damned false prophet end quote, which was a statement that Joe could never tolerate. And he quote came up and struck Stoddard in the forehead with his flat hand. The blow knocked him down when Smith repeated the blow four or five times very hard, made him blind. That Smith afterwards came to him and asked his forgiveness, was satisfied, had forgiven him, would have forgiven any man who would injure him and ask his forgiveness, end quote. So to summarize, Joe and Calvin Soddard, you know, brothers-in-law, got into an argument about who was the better water witch, and it ended up with Joe repeatedly bashing Calvin's head against the ground so hard that Calvin temporarily went blind. It's all good, though, you guys, because Joe asked for forgiveness, and Calvin was kind enough to forgive him. God is just so good to forgive his prophet of any trespasses against his children. Who needs criminal charges and legal punishment when God says that everything's all good? Joe also fought with his brother, William Smith, at around the same time. Now, I'm going to be clear here. Crazy Willie was, he was one of the Quorum of the Twelve. He was an apostle of the church. He was also a really tough dude to deal with. Now, Willie's introduction into the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles was a topic of heated debate because Bloody Brigham and not so smarty Marty Martin Harris considered Crazy Willie too unpredictable and therefore unworthy to be an apostle in the church. In October of 1835, Joe and Crazy Willie had a fight that nearly ended in fisticuffs. The issue apparently wasn't resolved because on December 16th, just a couple months later, 1835, Joe and Crazy Willie got into it again, which actually did involve a physical altercation. Now, here's Joe describing it in the official history of the church. Quote, This evening, according to adjournment, I went to Brother William Smith's to take part in the debate that was commenced Saturday evening last. After the debate was concluded and a decision given in favor of the affirmative of the question, some altercation took place upon the propriety of continuing the debate, fearing that it would not result in good. Brother William Smith opposed these measures and insisted on having another question proposed, and at length became much enraged, particularly at me, the prophet of God. I added that. <laughs> you get the point. And used violence upon my person, and also upon Elder Jared Carter and some others for which I am grieved beyond measure, and can only pray God to forgive him inasmuch as he repents of his wickedness and humbles himself before the Lord. End quote. It's even been claimed that the physical damage that Crazy Willie inflicted on Joe that day in December of 1835 was enough that Joe suffered from the effects of it until the day he died. The next day in the history of the church, it starts out with, quote, at home, quite unwell, end quote. Crazy Willie apparently packed quite a punch, probably learned from his and Joe's shared childhood in the impoverished Smith home fighting for limited resources. It wasn't until the 29th of December, two weeks later, that Joe finally brought up formal charges against Crazy Willie, probably because Joe was sick in bed from having his ass beat so hard by his younger brother. The charges are as follows, quote, To the Honorable Presidency of the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints against Elder William Smith, first unchristian like conduct in speaking disrespectfully of President Joseph Smith Jr. and the revelations and commandments given through him, second, for attempting to inflict personal violence on President Joseph Smith Jr., end quote. This little, I don't know if altercation is the right way to describe it, this fight, this fist fight, led to Crazy Willie being disfellowshipped from the church. Imagine that. Joe's ego gets beat up just as much as his physical body. And then the younger brother who inflicted that harm gets cut off from the church. Amazing. Now, 
Apparently, Willie and Joe reconcile a week later on January 2nd, 1836, after apparently asking each other's forgiveness, and then Crazy Willie will, you know, returned to fellowship in the church. But at the end of the day, Joe and Crazy Willie's problem was probably that they were just too much alike. And Joe had a habit of finding those types of men and basically using them until they were no longer a benefit, and then attacking them in one way or another, whether that was Oliver Cowdery or Hinchman Sidney Rigdon or Crazy, Crazy Willie Smith or Frederick G. Williams, Freddie G. Willie or Dr. Samson of Art or John C. Reck Bennett or any other names of close acolytes who were later pushed out of Joe's movement. This pattern begins to come into focus. So let's fast forward to, you know, a little bit later in 1836. And that's actually the year that Charles Darwin completed his five-year journey abroad on the HMS Beagle. 1836 is a year when Joe's fury took a darker and more violent turn. Joe had just returned from his treasure digging trip in Massachusetts and after he got hoodwinked and the Quorum of Apostles were devising an assassination plot against him. If not for Bloody Brigham Young riding out of Kirtland to meet Joe before he returned to Kirtland, the Quorum of Apostles may have been successful in assassinating Joseph Smith, episode 37. Around this time that Joe established the Curlin Bank, the Curlin Safety Society Anti-Banking Company, we talk about it a lot, he also established an, or an organization that was the precursor to the later Danites, the Mormon Shadow Enforcement Squad, the Assassination Ring. This was called the Brother of Gideon Society. The Brody, Brother of Gideon Society its existence is not very well documented, and its actions are even more mysterious than its existence. In fact, virtually the only source of the Brother of Gideon Society is, you know, witness to the gold plates and the official church historian, John Goebbels Whitmer. He writes in his history, quote, after Smith's return to Kirtland, Ohio, from Salem, Massachusetts, and after his ordering the first elders of the church to go to Ohio, there to receive their endowments from on high, he hastened the, fishing, the finishing of the house at Kirtland, which was commenced before he had gone to Zion to redeem her. He, from this time, began to be lifted up in the pride of his eyes. Pride cometh before the fall. And he began to seek riches and the glory of the world. Also sought to establish the ancient order of things. And he and his counselors, Rigdon and Hiram Smith, pleased to call it. Therefore, they began to form themselves into a secret society, which they termed the Brother of Gideon in the which society they took oaths that they would support a brother right or wrong, even to the shedding of blood. Thus, those who belonged to this society were bound to keep it a profound secret, never to reveal but ever to conceal these abominations from all, and every person except those who were of the same craft. But these things could not be kept a secret." in consequence of betrayers who fell from their faith and revealed the secrets, end quote. This era surrounding the Kirtland Safety Society anti-banking company marks a hard shift in Joe's ministry. He transitions from, you know, party boy with a following based around his, you know, cult of personality to an overt crime lord. Joe had shown an aversion toward, you know, laws his entire life. But once the Kirtland Safety Society and the Brother of Gideon Society were formed, his actions trend far more towards secretive, clandestine, and revolutionary. He isn't traveling halfway across the civilized country to hunt for buried treasure anymore. He's forming secret alliances with blood oaths. He isn't getting into scrapes with people that offended him anymore. He's ordering Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell to pay them a visit and to do his bidding. He isn't the self-appointed prophet of a charming fringe religious cult anymore. He's the head of a crime syndicate with a street gang of thugs. Notably as well, most historians point to 1842 as the time in Joe's life when he emulated masonry with his endowment ceremony and, you know, sparked up these more clandestine groups of the Quorum of the Anointed, the Second Endowment, and so on and so forth. However, 
This brother of Gideon's society is clearly of Masonic origins and shows just how much Masonry had seeped into Joe's religious praxis. Understandably, though, because the secretive nature of Masonry, it was very appealing to a person with such criminal tendencies as Joseph Smith. Episode 36. This secret combination, if you will, was more than just a boys club with special handshakes and death oaths of secrecy. In 1837, Joe was tried for attempted homicide against a guy named Grandison Newell, episode 39. Grandison Newell had filed nearly a dozen lawsuits against the prophet by this time, so Joe had plenty of reason to be annoyed with Grandison Newell. I don't know if annoyed is the right term, you know, maybe angered with, wrathful with Grandison Newell. That shouldn't surprise anyone because Joe had run himself and, and his church into over a million dollars of 2020 money in debt. Grandison Newell was one of his creditors, but trying to have one of his creditors assassinated, like that's a new level for Joe. His transition from religious leader to a demagogue with purely corporate interests hits an important milestone here in 1837. Now, previous court hearings against Joe usually fell along the lines of him, you know, hoodwinking somebody on a business deal or maybe calling a church leader into question for apostasy or whatever the case may have been. It doesn't really matter much. But Grandison Newell charged that Joe tried to have him killed by commanding it done by two men named Marvel Davis and Solomon Denton. This situation sets itself apart as a defining moment in Mormon history and in Joe's leadership. According to Denton's testimony at trial here, Joe told them that he had had a revelation that Grandison Newell should be killed and that God would justify the deed. It's Nephi and Laban all over again. Fortunately, the assassins, Davis and Denton, couldn't bring themselves to go through with the assassination, so Grandison Newell survived the attempt. Apostle Orson Hyde also testified that he had heard Joe make threatening comments about Newell. The court testimony ultimately acquitted Joe because there wasn't actually enough evidence that an attempted assassination plot actually occurred, but as was the case with his previous trials in 1826 and 1830, the witness testimony is far more damning than the actual verdict of the court. This was another of the many tensions which created sharp divisions among the Kirtland leadership. It wasn't just the debt the church had fallen into, that Joe had dragged the church into, but also Joe's bloodthirsty solutions to that debt. Eventually, the Parishites marched into the Kirtland Temple during a sermon and held the congregation up at gunpoint in a forceful bid to take over the leadership. As a result of this, a brawl ensued, and legal complaints were filed all around. Episode 40. This, coupled with the Fanny Alger incident, episode 33, the collapse of the Kirtland Safety Society, episode 38, not so smarty Marty testifying that he never saw the gold plates with his natural eyes, but with spiritual eyes, episode 40, and also brazen and self-serving power grabs by divine revelation, re, divine revelation, episode 41, and also just massive debts that were incurred from terrible business practices and purchasing the mummies and other ancient Egyptian artifacts for no reason, episode 33. All of these factors caused the Kirtland church to implode. Rival factions were formed known as the Parishites, the Brucerites, the Church of Christ run by Coe, Smalling, and Harris. These groups formally declared Joseph Smith to be a fallen prophet, and the groups excommunicated each other. Joe Hinchpin Rigdon and the majority of the Quorum of Apostles lost the, bab the battle in the court of public opinion, and they were forced to flee Kirtland in the middle of the night for Missouri, leaving the temple and a bunch of other church property in the hands of creditors and these rival factions. Upon their arrival in Missouri, tensions only continued to escalate. 
These tensions had been boiling since the Mormons began settling in Missouri in 1831. The Missourians and the Mormons had essentially reached a place of peaceful coexistence, and nothing overtly combative happened from 1835 to 1838. However, when Joe and Rigdon arrived in town in early 1838, the peace was quickly broken for multiple reasons we're about to discuss. First, the Mormons in Missouri had agreed to not have any more Mormons immigrate to Missouri. However, those loyal to Joe followed him from Kurland to Missouri, bringing an influx of hundreds of Mormons to the Mormon settlements in Missouri, violating the treaty. Second, the Mormon leaders of the Missouri church, they posed a threat to Joe's leadership, and he excommunicated them. However, those were the men who had negotiated peace with the Missourians. Their removal from church leadership meant removal of the peacekeepers from that leadership, and the Missourians bristled against this removal. Third, the Mormons had agreed to remain in Caldwell County, which was formed basically for their settlement. But when Joe and his revolutionary buddies, Hinchpin Rigdon, Bloody Brigham Young, and the other members of the Quorum of Apostles arrived in Missouri, the Mormons immediately began expanding into Davies, into Carroll, Boone, Lafayette, and Ray counties, thus violating more provisions of this peace treaty. And finally, fourth, the warlike rhetoric spewed by Joe and Rigdon quickly escalated for various reasons, not least of which was because the Mormons needed a common enemy. A common enemy they could rally against, and the Missourians had been longtime enemies of the Mormons, even though peace had been brokered for three years before Joe and Rigdon came riding into town. So let's kind of walk through each of these elements, kind of try to break them down and tease out the details that comprise each of these four details. Up to this point, the Mormons had had a truce with the Missourians, under which the Mormons were allowed to have Caldwell County all to themselves, and in return, they promised to not expand into neighboring counties. In April 1838, Joe and Rigdon violated this truce by sending settlers into neighboring Davies County to establish the town of Adam on Diamon which was essentially a second headquarters to serve as a twin city to far west in Caldwell County, the, the primary Mormon settlement there. In July 1837, Double Dub Phelps, William Wise Phelps, notified the saints in Kurland that public notice had been given, quote, by the mob in Davies County for the Mormons to leave that county by the 1st of August and go into Caldwell, end quote. Joe and Rigdon knew that sending Mormons to settle the nearby counties was a provocative act. According to a deposition gathered in preparation for Joe and Rigdon's trial for treason later that year, 1838, quote, as early as April at a meeting in, that's April 1838, at a meeting in far west of eight or 12 persons, Mr. Rigdon arose and made an address to them in which he spoke of having borne persecutions and lawsuits and other privations and did not intend to bear them any longer, that they meant to resist the law. And if a sheriff came after them with writs, they would kill him. And if anybody opposed them, they would take off their heads. George W. Harris, who was present, observed, you meant the head of their influence, I suppose, Rigdon answered. He meant that lump of flesh and bones called the skull or scalp, end quote. According to Robert Snodgrass, Joe preached in follow-up, quote, that the time had now come that the saints should rise and take the kingdom, and they should do it by the sword of the spirit, and if not, by the sword of power, end quote. The Mormon, the Missouri Mormon war didn't actually start until August after the Gallatin election. We're going to talk about that in a second here. So if Joe and Rigdon were agitating for cutting off people's heads in April of 1838, then that was long before any mobs actually came against them. This militant language that began as rhetoric was soon realized for the remainder of 1838. One can't help but wonder, was the rhetoric calculated to galvanize the Mormons, or did it come from a genuine place of 
you know, us versus them tribalism? That's a tough question because the results are the same, but the motivation and intent is worth examination. The result may be the same, but the end game was clearly different. That's a complicated way to look at this, and it takes into account three aspects of the Missouri-Mormon War, intention, result, and goals. If the goal, thereby the intent, was simply survival in the state surrounded by anti-Mormons, then warlike rhetoric was the worst thing the Mormon leadership could do because it ensured a war. It ensured their removal from the state. If, however, the goal was to take over the nation, starting with Missouri, the intent and thereby the goals are completely different. And the goal itself is revolutionary and far more dangerous than just survival and coexistence. This abstract consideration takes into account value judgments made by the Mormon leadership, Joe and Rigdon. Did they view the Mormons as their people that they'd go to incredible lengths to foster growth and the well-being of? Or... Were the Mormons merely pawns in their overall goals of taking over the country? There's no way that we can know for sure what was their, you know, what was going on in their minds as the Mormons waxed militant throughout 1838. But that question is important. What was the actual end game for Joe and Rigdon? What was their real intention with escalating the relationship between the Mormons and the Gentile Missourians? The events of the Missouri-Mormon War could be construed to arrive at many different conclusions on this question, but what I see is a set of events which would be echoed in the Mormon settlement of Nauvoo in Illinois, eventually leading the state of Illinois, arriving on the precipice of civil war. Now, I'll talk more on this line of thought in a little while once we've kind of discussed the Missouri-Mormon War itself. A primary aggressor in these tensions was none other than Hingepin Rigdon himself. In fact, it was Rigdon, not Governor Boggs, who first called for a quote-unquote war of extermination. In Rigdon's famous 4th of July oration, he declared, quote, We take God and all the angels to witness this day, that we will warn all men in the name of Jesus Christ to come on us no more forever. For from this hour we will bear it no more. Our rights shall no more be trampled on with impunity. The man or set of men who attempts it does it at the expense of their lives. And that mob that comes on us to disturb us, it shall be between us and them a war of extermination. For we will follow them till the last drop of their blood is spilled, or else they will have to exterminate us. For we will carry the seat of war to their own houses and their own families. And one party or the other shall be utterly destroyed. Remember it then, all men. End quote. After Rigdon finished preaching this infamous war of extermination, this July 4th oration, Joseph Smith got up and praised Rigdon's speech as a, quote, declaration of independence from all mobs and persecutions, end quote, which had been inflicted upon the saints time after time until we could bear it no longer. Remember, Boggs' famous extermination order wasn't issued until October, nearly four months after Rigdon preached this sermon calling for a war of extermination. Several Mormons later recognized Rigdon's sermon as the main cause of the war between the Mormons and the Missourians. Now, it should be noted that this famous or rather infamous July 4th oration was actually printed from the Mormon press in Far West. If it was meant to be only an internal speech to rally up the Mormons and galvanize the troops just heard by the Mormons themselves, then it would have remained as only an oral delivery. However, because it was printed and distributed among the Mormons and the non-Mormons, the Missourians understood the dire situation that Rigdon and Joe were creating in the Mormon settlements in Missouri. It was, indeed, Joe and Rigdon who fired the first oratorical shots in the 1838 war in Missouri. 
only after this was given and the tensions continued escalating, the Governor Lilburn Boggs adopted Rigdon's language in his Mormon extermination order that we're going to discuss in a minute here that forced the Mormons out of the state of Missouri at the point of a bayonet. This single datum is all you need to refute the claim that it was legal to murder Mormons in the state of Missouri until the 1970s. Joe and Rigdon themselves were responsible for the language that was used by Governor Boggs to forcibly remove the Mormons from Missouri. Here's a quote from Leland Gentry's book, Fire and Sword, A History of Latter-day Saints in Northern Missouri, which illustrates my point. Quote, Ebenezer Robinson insists that it exerted a powerful influence in arousing the people of the whole upper Missouri country, it being Rigdon's oration, right? Said Brigham Young in 1844, Elder Rigdon was the prime cause of our troubles in Missouri by his Fourth of July oration. Also in 1844, Jedediah M. Grant called Rigdon's talk the main auxiliary that fanned into a flame the burning wrath of the mobocratic portion of the Missourians. This point of view seems particularly credible in light of Rigdon speaking of a war of extermination between the saints and their enemies, the very words Governor Lilburn H. Boggs used in executive orders for the Mormons to leave the state. End quote. Meanwhile, Smith and Rigdon were also setting up the secret organization known as the Daughters of Zion, or the Danites. Originally, the purpose of the Danites was to punish Mormon dissenters like the ones who had driven Joe and Hinchpin out of Kirtland in the first place. Some of the dissenters, Double Dub Phelps, John Whitmer, Lyman E. Johnson, had followed Joe and Rigdon West to set up a dissenter church in Missouri. Joe and Rigdon were not having this from men that they previously considered confidence and co-conspirators. On June 17th, Rigdon gave a sermon called the Salt Sermon, not to be confused with his July 4th oration, although it commonly is, and it's based on a biblical verse from the book of Matthew, quote, If the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men, end quote. The July 4th oration that I read from earlier, that was aimed at enemies of the church from the outside world, the Missourians, the Gentiles. The salt sermon, however, was aimed squarely at dissenters from within the ranks. The dissenters were the salt in this metaphor, and the Danites were the ones doing the trotting underfoot. Here's another quote from Leland Gentry's book, Fire and Sword, quote, Some of the anti-Mormons have maintained that Rigdon told his listeners that the real saints should literally trample on the dissenters until their bowels gushed out. How much of this represents the words of Rigdon, one cannot say. But this much is certain. Sidney's salt sermon was inflammatory and threatening, end quote. And it's not like Rigdon was way off the reservation here. His sermon echoed Doctrine and Covenants section 104, verse 5, which said, quote, For I, the Lord, have decreed in my heart that inasmuch as any man belongeth to the order shall be found a transgressor, or in other words, shall break the covenant with which ye are bound, he shall be cursed in this life and shall be trodden down by whom I will, end quote. After Rigdon finished preaching this salt sermon, Joe apparently got up and once again endorsed what he had said. Joe had an opportunity to calm people down and to cut off the escalation from that point forward, but Joe chose not to. Because of that decision, over a hundred Mormons died and thousands suffered. Now, I should note here, in our struggle timeline, Rigdon has taken a back seat during the Nauvoo era. That's because he was deliberately pushed to the sidelines after the Missouri-Mormon War by Joseph Smith himself, who probably blamed him for what a, a lot of what happened during the Missouri-Mormon War. Prior to 1839, the year after the, the war, Rigdon's power and influence over the church cannot be overstated. He was Joe's second in command. 
but their actual relationship would be better characterized as like Rigdon had ideas and Joe often went along with them as kind of the likable charismatic who could help kind of sway the masses in favor of Rigdon's ideas. Rigdon became washed up during the Nauvoo era when Joe had lots of other friends who were just as revolutionary as him. Rigdon learned lessons during the Missouri Mormon War, that you can only push the system so far before the system retaliates. Joseph Smith, on the other hand, learned that you can only push the system so far before it completely breaks. After Rigdon's salt sermon, in response, the Danites wrote up a resolution signed by 84 Mormon men that told the dissenters to leave town. Known as the Danite Manifesto, it said, quote, Vengeance sleepeth not, neither does it slumber. And unless you heed us this time and attend to our request, it, vengeance, it will overtake you at an hour you do not expect and at a day when you do not look for it. And for you there shall be no escape, for there is but one decree for you, which is depart, depart, or a more fatal calamity shall befall you. End quote. I'm sure, you know, a falling piano or, you know, a sudden heart attack, something that's, you know, totally unexpected, a fatal calamity of sorts. The first signature on the Danite Manifesto, this document, was the name of Samson of Vard, whom Smith and Rigdon had made basically the nominal head of the Danites. When Danite violence later became exposed to the public, Samson Avard became the fall guy that Smith and Rigdon blamed for the formation of the Danites. This didn't fly because Samson Avard became the star witness for the prosecution after the Mormons surrendered in Missouri uh, in this November Court of Inquiry, and you know because he defected from the church, he became a hero among anti-Mormon Missourians. But as a result of the Danite Manifesto. The dissenters were terrified, and they fled town to avoid being killed. Episode 43. Throughout the summer of 1838, tensions continued to rise. Mormons continued settling in counties in violation of the treaty that was brokered among the Missouri and the Missourians and the Missouri Mormon Church leadership. You know, Ollie Cowdery, D. Day David Whitmer, John Goebbels Whitmer, and all of the Missourians. But those guys had been pushed out. They were people who were targeted by the Danite Manifesto and told to leave town or a fatal calamity shall befall you. Those guys had all been excommunicated. And the Missourians had no reason to believe that the Mormons would continue to honor any aspect of the treaty that had been signed with those guys. The warlike rhetoric continued to escalate as well. And the Mormons tried their best to, you know, exercise their constitutional right of democracy, which ruffled Missourian feathers even more. Eventually, the powder kegs that the Mormons and the Missourians were filling underneath their own homes were destined to ignite. This escalation to actual open warfare happened on August 6th, 1838, when Davies County held its county election at the town of Gallatin. The Missouri citizens of Davies County feared that the Mormons would vote as a block and would therefore gain control of county politics, so some of them gathered at the polling place in the city of Gallatin in order to prevent the Mormons from voting. Episode 44. According to historian Stephen Lesur, he reconstructs it with some extremely vivid details, including allusions to the Danite Oath of Vengeance and defending a brother in trouble, even at the cost of one's own life. Quote, The Mormons, about 30 in number, watched cautiously as Peniston what a wonderful name, Peniston, stepped from the barrel and good-naturedly called on everyone to have a drink. While the Missourians passed around the whiskey, Dick Weldon, a longtime resident of Davies County, informed the crowd that in Clay County, the Mormons had not been allowed to vote, quote, no more than the Negroes, end quote. Weldon, who was reportedly drunk, accosted a small Mormon shoemaker, Samuel Brown. Are you a Mormon preacher, sir? He asked Brown. Yes, sir, I am. Do you Mormons believe in healing the sick by laying on of hands, speaking in tongues, and casting out devils? 
we do, said Brown. You're a damned liar. Joseph Smith is a damned imposter, Weldon replied. Weldon then began striking Brown. When other Mormons attempted to restrain Weldon, five or six Missourians jumped into the fray. John L. Butler, a large and powerful Mormon, rankled at the abuse heaped upon his people. The first thing that came to my mind was the covenants entered into by the Danites to the effect that they were to protect each other, Butler recalled. And I hallowed out at the top of my voice saying, oh, yes, you Danites, here is a job for us. When Butler gave the Danite signal of distress, about ten more Latter-day Saints ran to the defense of their brethren. Seeing this, forty or fifty Missourians stepped in to battle the Mormons. I had witnessed many knockdowns in my time, but none on so grand a scale, wrote Joseph McGee, a non-Mormon observer of the fight. The participants used no guns, but struck at one another with whips, clubs, rocks, and knives. The Mormons rallied behind Butler, who wielded a large wooden club he found in a nearby pile of wood. When I called out for the Danites, a power rested upon me, such as one I never felt before, Butler later wrote. I never struck a man the second time, and while knocking them down, I really felt that they would soon embrace the gospel. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> yeah, no. Baptism by wooden club. Real effective. It's the Catholic way, right? As a result of this Gallatin election day battle, everybody retreated from the battle before any actual life-threatening injuries. Missourians and Mormons alike had bloodied and fractured skulls, some had broken bones, and even a Mormon man fled with a knife sticking out of his back between his shoulder blades. The effects of this brawl, however, extended far beyond the physical harm incurred by the participants, as this was the spark that ignited those powder kegs, the, the existing tensions, and caused an actual war. Now, if you don't mind a brief digression, a troubling aspect of the human condition bears just a brief examination here. Where does this end? Joe Rigdon, the Mormon leadership, they had been cultivating the Mormons for years with rhetoric about enemies of the kingdom of God, the adversary trying to eradicate the gospel and bring about another great apostasy. The end of days is nigh at hand, persecution of God's righteous people. For the Mormons, they had been programmed for years to understand that a war was coming and they would need to fight in that war. This election day fight was exactly the final sign they were looking for. For the Mormons, Jesus was returning any minute, and they needed to sell their clothes for a sword and consecrate their property to the church as the evil of the world would soon be destroyed and the chosen people of God would be exalted to reign at the right hand of the Savior in Zion. This apocalyptic narrative pervades the church to this day. Fasten your seatbelt, hang on through the bumps, and do what's right. Your reward will be eternal. Enough of this programming and rhetoric and violence is the inevitable result. Vilification of one's enemies, an elitist complex of one's own beliefs, and this warped view of the depravity of humanity lost to the adversary that can only result in this unmitigated horror from just this misplaced superiority and the resulting holy wars. In my opinion, this kind of apocalyptic speech is far more dangerous than much of what we understand free speech laws to outlaw today. You tell a group of people to kill a specific person, like the leader of like the wealthiest religion in America, as an example, that's inciting violence, and you're, you're liable for inciting violence. However, if you tell a group of people over generations that their enemy is at the gates and they're trying to lead you astray, they're trying to kill you, they're trying to steal your children, that the world is ending and your allegiance to the cause is going to be tested, that you must resist all appearance of evil, and that you'll have to agree to have yourself murdered if you reveal the secrets that they tell you, and then people are murdered as a result of this rhetoric, that's religious liberty being exercised. That's a dangerous concept. And it happens every day. And there's no legal remedy for it because it doesn't involve, you know, 
more religious freedom because more religious freedom it seems to be a bulletproof defense in the legal sphere. Rayton and Joe had riled up the Mormons for years and people died because of it. The same thing happened in Utah under bloody Brigham Young. He programmed the Mormons in Utah territory for over a decade that the end of the world was coming and that the enemies were at the gates. And when an unassuming caravan of immigrants passed through Utah on their way to California, they were all murdered in cold blood. In addition to the, the, the thousands of Native Americans who were killed all at the same time, this escalation, this rhetoric kills people. Joe and Rigdon are responsible for murder. It, like This could have been avoided, but instead of relaxing the tensions and walking back the rhetoric, it benefited Joe and Rigdon to escalate the rhetoric and to force more energy into this feedback loop, and people died because of it. The blood of those people was on the hands of the prophet, but he never suffered for the pain, for the anguish, and for the human cost for which he was responsible. Oh, Joseph Smith languished in Liberty Jail for five months. Well, he should have been in jail for the rest of his life, or given the legal standards of the day, he should have been hung for committing treason and murder. I'm going to have some more to say on that because it's kind of like the, the fundamental moral question of today's show. But just keep in mind, like this mentality, this rhetoric happens every day in the the mainstream church and in fundamentalist groups to a greater extent today. Like on the Glassbox podcast, we're reading Cleon Skousen's The Naked Communist published in 1953 at the beginning of the Red Scare. And it really captures the modern day culture of the mainstream church today really articulates the apocalyptic rhetoric that is used of us versus them. This, this bloodthirsty rhetoric that is overtly dangerous, that actually carries a body count with it. Let's get back to the story. Once the Gallatin election day brawl, this fight occurred, the Mormons ended up taking the offensive in the form of ceremonious preventative measures that actually resulted in intimidation. What they did is the Mormons gathered their forces, the Danites, and they went to the homes of some prominent anti-Mormon leaders who were elected officials in Missouri government and threatened those people and their families and forced them to sign statements that they would support the Mormons in the coming conflict under duress. Let me uh, just wrap your mind around that for a second. Let me just highlight how terrifying this would be if we saw it today. The Mormons gathered an armed militia and surrounded the homes of their enemies, the, the elected officials, government officials, and forced those people to sign documents supporting their cause under duress with threats of death. Those enemies were government officials. Imagine, like... Black Lives Matter or like an, uh, a, you know, National Rifle Association group surrounding the home of their senator with guns in hand and forcing the senator to sign a manifesto that gave deference to that group over all other political or religious groups with threats of death. Imagine a Muslim group doing that today. How fast would the Department of Homeland Security show up with tear gas and tanks and unmarked vans to just make all of those protesters disappear? Notably as well, like the Mormon cities at this time didn't allow journalists. They didn't allow outsiders within the city limits of the twin cities of Far West and Adam on Diamond for fear of giving their anti-Mormon neighbors the upper hand. Knowing the history of the Mormons in Missouri, it stuns me that any Mormon today opposes the protests that are happening in every major U.S. city for the past two and a half months in 2020 here. Just. Two years ago, like Joe was secretly calling for the assassination of a guy that he owed money to. <laughs> and just two years after that, he's surrounding the homes of elected officials with his own army. He came a long way in that short time. Really, like that's why I pinpoint the Kernless Safety Society as a turning point in Mormon history, because it is a transition. When Mormonism goes from being a wacky religious cult to being a militant religious sect. 
And to make matters worse, during all of this, neighboring Ray County sent a team of investigators who urged the Saints to basically follow the law and to stop with this rhetoric and to stop the escalating tensions. In response, the Saints told those investigators that they were done with the law. A posse from Richmond tried to arrest Joseph Smith and Lyman White, who was one of the more you know warlike guys in the high ranks of leadership. But the Mormons ended up mobilizing their own posse to protect their leaders. Governor Boggs, the governor of Missouri, ordered the state militia to that area to try and keep the peace. And this panicked Joe and Rigdon, who basically turned themselves in and then were immediately acquitted at a mock trial in September. For a few days after that mock trial, it seemed like the conflict might have been peacefully resolved. But then some of the Missourians' houses were burned down. The Missourians said that the Mormons burned their houses down, while the Mormons claimed that it was a false flag operation in which the Missourians had burned down their own houses and blamed the Mormons for it. And it's super hard to determine facts in this conflict because neither of those approaches are beyond possible and both are kind of believable. Although it's pretty hard to imagine a scenario where people burn down their own homes to what own the morms i guess in response to this ray county ended up sending a shipment of guns and ammunition to the missourians in davies county in order to combat the mormon escalation but the mormons intercepted that supply train and armed their own militia their own mob like the mormons were a mob they weren't a state sanctioned militia the mormons owned or, or armed their own mob with guns that they pillaged from state provisions. Yeah, the Mormons raided a state militia gun supply caravan, which also included a freaking cannon. The state militia ordered both sides to stand down, but it was way too late to calm down the boiling tensions between these two groups. Episode 45. In late September, an agreement was briefly made between the Missourians and the Mormons living in Davies County, not Caldwell and Clay, where the majority of the Mormons were settling, but in Davies, where Adam on Diamond, the burgeoning fledgling city, uh, was, was growing. On September 26th, they had a meeting to basically appraise the value of the non-Mormons' land and come to an agreement that the Mormons were going to buy out all of the non-Mormon citizens who were living in Davies County, essentially concentrating the Mormons' numbers and opening up a whole bunch of property for the endless stream of refugees who are arriving from Ohio and New York and Canada and Massachusetts and a bunch of other places. Converts were flooding into Missouri all the time. Now, among these converts were Sarah and Maria Lawrence, two of Joseph's teenage wives later on, along with William and Jane Law, two, let's just say, primary dissenters in the Nauvoo era. This September 26 agreement was perceived as basically a godsend by the Mormons because it created a temporary holdout in the adjacent county to Caldwell in Davies County. Most non-Mormons had already fled from Davies County by this point, but the few remaining holdouts weren't so happy and jovial about this September 26th agreement. And of course, because so many people were selling property at the same time to the Mormons, it drove prices down to a fraction of what it should have been worth if this wasn't wartime. So the non-Mormons in Davies County drew the short straw in a conflict that had nothing to do with them. Not only were the Missourians selling their property at a quarter of the price that it should have been worth, Joe and Rigdon we're buying up all the property on credit with church funds and then turning around and selling it to the Mormon refugees that were moving into Davies County and selling it at an inflated cost above what they had purchased it for. Because does, doesn't that just make Joe and Rigdon super duper good guys creating a refugee crisis and then making money from the people who are suffering through it? Joe and Rigdon are pretty much like the proto-Blackwater. Like, why did Joe wait until 1844 to run for president? However, all of this created a down, downwind problem because it set a precedent. The Mormons agreed to buy the non-Mormons out of their property, thus making Davies County an exclusive Mormon stronghold. Flip that equation around, and now the Mormons 
are essentially obligated to be bought out of their lands in counties where they don't hold the majority population. Separate but equal treatment for separate but equal people in different counties. That's exactly what happened in DeWitt, Carroll County. By the end of September, there were about 200 Mormons living in DeWitt. That's a very, very small lakeside town. And they had constructed a jerry-rigged village, basically, of just wagons and tents with a, just a few small permanent buildings. The Missourians, who'd been living in DeWitt long before the Mormons ever got there, became increasingly frustrated and hateful of the Mormons there. Especially given all of the surrounding circumstances that contributed to the you know Missouri just teetering on the edge of civil war at this time. By September 28th, the Missourians were performing daily military drills in full view of the Mormons in order to basically posture their military prowess. October 1st marked the first day of an actual siege of DeWitt, the Mormon settlement there, because the Mormons refused to leave to be bought out of their property in Carroll County, as had happened with the non-Mormons in Davies County. Within a few days, the Missourians ended up gathering 500 armed men to siege the town of DeWitt until it surrendered. Then a huge mistake happened. Joe and Rigdon, with a massive battery of reinforcements, showed up in DeWitt to try and administrate and to dispel the tensions. But of course, this only invigorated the excitement of the anti-Mormons to chase the Mormons out of DeWitt to a critical tipping point. By October 10th, barely a week later, just two weeks after uh, Victoria Woodhull, the first woman presidential candidate and a civil rights activist was born, the standing militias outside of DeWitt posed an unstoppable force against the Mormon solidarity to defend DeWitt or die as an immovable object. George M. Hinkle, the Mormon defense commander in DeWitt, realized that the situation couldn't be resolved favorably for the Mormons without massive bloodshed. And a decision was made among Rigdon, Joe, and George Hinkle that the surrender of DeWitt was the only option or the siege would starve the town until the anti-Mormon militias were merely waging battle on walking corpses. The Mormons in DeWitt forfeited their weapons and property and they evacuated the city without being bought out of their property as it happened with the non-Mormons in Davies County because they didn't willingly sign an agreement. Now, understandably, of course, this caused outcry among the Mormons who viewed this all as religious persecution because that's what Rigdon and Joe were telling them without recognizing that the Mormons were being forced to uphold this precedent that they had set when they bought the non-Mormons out of Davies County. On returning to Far West at the head of all of these refugees from DeWitt, Joe's rhetoric in his sermons waxed militant and dire. He fell into simplistic language and vilification of the enemies of the Mormons with, you know, buzzwords calculated to shut down the complexity of the issue. The mobocrats, the Missouri mobocrats, were, they were the Antifa of the day for Joe. According to jo George Walter, Joe declared that, quote, it was a time of war and the militia was nothing but a mob, that the state of Missouri was a mob, and that the governor himself was a mob character. It is time to lay religion aside and take up our guns, end quote. Thomas B. Marsh reported Joe saying, quote, he would yet tread down his enemies and walk over their dead bodies. And if he was not let alone, he would be a second Muhammad to this generation. And that it would be one gore of blood from the Rocky Mountains to the Atlantic Ocean. And that like Muhammad, whose motto was in treating for peace was the Al-Quran or the sword, so should it be eventually with us, Joseph Smith or the sword, end quote. The Danite meetings started to get really scary too. Here's a quote from the Reed Peck manuscript, quote, the blood of my best friend must flow by my own hands if I would be a faithful Danite, should the prophet command it, said Alexander McCray in my hearing. 
if Joseph should tell me to kill Van Buren in his presidential chain, that's Martin Van Buren, the president of the United States at the time, I would immediately start and do my work to assassinate him. Let the consequences be what they would, end quote. And Danite commander Samson of Vard organized the Danites into companies and gave them this order, quote, Know ye not, brethren, that it soon will be your privilege to take your respective companies and go on a scout on the borders of the settlements and take to yourselves spoils of the ungodly Gentiles. For it is written in the Doctrine and Covenants, the riches of the Gentiles shall be consecrated to my people, the house of Israel. Thus, waste away the Gentiles by robbing and plundering them of their property. And in this way, we will build up the kingdom of God and roll forth the little stone that Daniel saw cut out of the mountain without hands until it shall fill the whole earth. For this is the very way that God designs to build up his kingdom in the last days. End quote. That, from Samson of Ard, preaching to the Danites, that is scriptural justification from Joe's own revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants, which Joseph Smith and Samson of Ard used to justify what they would do next to pillage and burn the homes and businesses of non-Mormons in Davies County. Joe heard rumors that the mob had burned some Mormons' town, uh, Mormons' houses in Davies County. So Joe marched 100 to 150 armed men, Danites, from far west to Caldwell County to Adam on Diamond in Davies County. From the time they arrived, there was a, a, a big snowstorm. And according to Joe's history, he found the city of Adam on Diamond full of refugees, including, quote, women and children, some in the most delicate condition. My feelings were such as I cannot describe when I saw them flock into the village, almost entirely destitute of clothes and only escaping with their lives, end quote. Joe put them there. They were in that situation because of him. And I'd be willing to bet that thought never crossed his mind. Joe was a solutions guy, not an abstract self-reflective guy. Now, somehow seeing all of these refugees, Joe had to feed and clothe all of these people. His solution was to dispatch Apostle David Patton, known as Captain Fear Not, because Mormons are so good with nicknames. Any longtime listeners of the show know that. Captain Fear Not, with a bunch of troops, rode to Gallatin, where the Election Day battle occurred. The brawl, I guess I should say. And also the Wild Ram of the Mountains, Lyman White. They took off with a bunch of troops to Millport, another city, uh, another non-Mormon city. Now, the mission of these ragtag Mormon militiamen, well, their mission was to loot the non-Mormon towns. The citizens of Gallatin caught wind that the Mormons were headed their way, and they fled as soon as Patton's troops arrived. And then Lyman White's troops apparently found Millport already abandoned by the time they got there. And both of these groups of militant Mormons, these Danites, chased out the few remaining citizens in these cities, and then they looted their homes and businesses. They carried off all of the possessions that they could, and they burned those cities to the ground. The troops then returned to Adam on Diamond with hogs, cattle, and piles of stolen furniture and goods to supply the refugees. Episode 46. Looting non-Mormon settlements solved the Mormons' starvation problem in the short term, but it created a different problem. General David R. Atchison of the Missouri Militia had been mostly favorable to the Mormons up to this point. He'd kind of been on their side. But on October 22nd, he heard what happened in Gallatin and Millport, and he sent a letter to Missouri Governor Lilburn W. Boggs reporting that the Mormons had apparently completely lost their minds and they were just committing depredations. They were burning cities to the ground. This letter points out the failings when an insufficient information network transmits orders and military commands with very little ability to immediately verify that information. Quote, 
Almost every hour, I receive information of outrage and violence, of burning and plundering in the county of Davies. It seems that the Mormons have become desperate and act like madmen. They have burned a store at Gallatin. They have burnt Millport. They have, it is said, plundered several houses and have taken away the arms from diverse citizens of that country. A cannon was employed in the siege of DeWitt in Carroll County and taken for a like purpose to Davies County, has fallen into the hands of the Mormons. It is also reported that the anti-Mormons have, when opportunity offered, disarmed the Mormons and burnt several of their houses, end quote. General David Atchison was one of the few who had his head on straight in the conflict, and he declined to send his troops into Davis County because he wasn't an idiot. He knew that his sending his own troops in to meet the Danites would just escalate the situation and result in a, a, a river of blood. He didn't want to, to that to happen, and he thought that the optics wouldn't really look great if the state militia were to drive the Mormons from the state. General... Atchison and General Alexander Donovan were two guys who were working constantly on behalf of the Mormons to try and de-escalate this Mormon, th this situation when the Mormons themselves were doing nothing to help their own situation. So what happens when you're led by a guy who has absolutely no military training, who has no idea what he's doing and is just winging it, making short-term decisions on a day-to-day -day basis? and playing into his own militant and apocalyptic rhetoric. Unfortunately for everybody in this situation, Governor Lilburn Boggs was done. Up till now, Governor Boggs had been trying to sort of keep the peace, but now he decided, gathering this intel, it was finally time to clear out the rebel Mormon settlements. Governor Boggs removed General Atchison from command, one of the very few Mormon allies who was a non-Mormon, who was an, an actual commissioned member, a commissioned general of the Missouri militia. Governor Boggs removed Atchison, uh, and he ordered the other generals to raise hundreds more soldiers from the nearby counties in order to completely overwhelm the Mormon militias. A brief point worth mentioning here. Governor Boggs didn't come to the area to handle matters personally. In spite of multiple petitions from the Mormons and from his own generals, Governor Boggs remained in Richmond throughout this entire conflict, and he merely issued decrees based on the limited information that he was receiving from his own men and letters that were coming in on a you know week to two week delay. This was Boggs' blunder throughout the whole Missouri-Mormon War. He received information, some of it merely rumors, and then he acted on that information, opening the door for any of his underlings who were trying to make a name for themselves to escalate the conflict and to take matters into their own hands. On October 24th, a unit under the command of Captain Samuel Bogart captured a couple of Mormon spies, as the Mormons had done with some <laughs> Missouri militiamen. They, they were capturing spies back and forth. Now, believing that Bogart might execute these prisoners, Apostle David W. Patton, Captain Fearnot, led a group of Mormons, of Danites, in a raid on Crooked River, where the militia, where Bogart's militia was encamped in order to try and rescue these Mormon prisoners. Captain Fearnot's men set up an ambush and aggressively attacked Captain Bogart's camp at 3 a.m. and routed them. Now, these were the first actual shots that were fired in the Missouri-Mormon conflict. The Mormons sustained losses. Three Mormons, including Apostle David W. Patton, Captain Fearnot himself, were killed. And at least one of the Missouri militiamen were also killed. And many were wounded in the melee once all of the firearms had been discharged. This was known as the Battle of Crooked River. This was an altogether unexpected attack for Bogart's men. They scattered in all directions in darkness at 3 a.m., carrying with them stories of a Mormon massacre to any nearby village. While the actual numbers, the actual casualties were very minimal, the rumors claimed that only a few of Bogart's men actually survived the attack. And of course, all of these rumors 
found their way back to Governor Boggs, who now considered the Mormons in open defiance and waging civil war on the citizens of his state. To add complexity, Governor Boggs was also receiving intel about the Mormon depredations across Davies and Carroll counties. At the same time, Thomas B. Marsh and Dr. Samson Avard, two Danites and confidants of the inner circle of Mormon leadership, defected from the church and they filed affidavits about the existence of the Danites and the Mormons looting and burning villages throughout Davies County and, and Carroll County. Dr. Samson Avard also retained a copy of the Danite Manifesto, his death threats against dissenters from within the ranks. All of these factors became the final straw for Governor Lilburn Boggs. On October 27th, he put an anti-Mormon general named John B. Clark as a commander of the state militia, and Governor Boggs issued his infamous Executive Order Number 44, also known as the Mormon Extermination Order, hearkening to Rigdon's War of Extermination rhetoric from July 4th. Mormon Extermination Order says in part, quote, This morning, I have received information of the most appalling character, which entirely changes the face of things and places the Mormons in the attitude of an open and avowed defiance of the laws and of having made war upon the people of this state. That information that he received was about the Battle of Crooked River. Your orders are, therefore, to hasten your operation with all possible speed. The Mormons must be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state, if necessary, for the public peace. Their outrages are beyond all description. Episode 47. Three days after this order was issued, some Missouri militia troops committed the gruesome massacre at Hans Mill. Episode 48. Just a few days after that, with Far West surrounded by Missouri militia, Joseph Smith surrendered the town and the Missourians took many of the Mormon leaders, including Joe and Hingepin City Rigdon, who were responsible for all of this, into custody to be tried for high treason against the state. The rest of the saints were forced to flee from Missouri to Illinois, a third mass exodus which occurred throughout the winter and into the spring of 1838 to 1839. In November of 1838, Missouri held a 17 day long court of inquiry in order to collect evidence on the treason charges against Joe and the other Mormon leaders. This trial was a court of inquiry. It was exclusively for the purpose of indictment, not an actual jury trial on the facts. The judge only held this court of inquiry to determine if there was enough available evidence to move forward with an actual prosecution and a jury trial. However, because no defense witnesses were called due to the function of the court of inquiry, it was claimed from that time forward in the Mormon persecution narrative that Missouri never let the Mormons call their own witnesses in defense. The Mormons weren't able to call witnesses because it wasn't an actual jury trial, but that didn't stop Joe from using that experience as a rally cry for the Mormons for the remainder of his life. The trial opened up with its star witness, Dr. Samson Avard, who turned state's evidence to avoid prosecution himself. Avard's decision to flip on Joe, who was previously the guy who organized the Danites, that may have been motivated by a belief that the Mormons' surrender meant that Joe was a false prophet in his mind. It doesn't really matter in my mind, but maybe it had something to do with his decision to flip on Joe. Among other things, Avar testified that, quote, We were advised all the time to fight valiantly and that the angels of the Lord would appear in our defense and fight our battles, end quote. Also testifying against Joe were Apostles Thomas B. Marsh and Orson Hyde, Orson Lahaydem. Suffice it to say, the testimony that these people provided was absolutely damning, and Joe would have been easily convicted had he not bribed his way out of Liberty Jail and fled to Illinois. The state of Missouri had Joseph Smith dead to rights 
And that is why Joe never stepped foot back in the state of Missouri from that time that he escaped prison until his death. It's also why so many different sheriffs and constables tried to extradite Joseph Smith to Missouri in order to answer for all of the charges involved in the Missouri Mormon War. But Joe was a super slippery guy. Episodes 50 and 51. Before we get into the Illinois era of the church, I want to spend a little bit of time on the trajectory of this conflict as it's going to help inform our discussion of Nauvoo. What was the intention and end game plan for Joe and Rigdon? They were co-conspirators in waging open warfare against the state of Missouri and the governor of the state himself had to handle the matters personally to keep his state from devolving into a years-long conflict. There were clearly you know, a lot of factors at play which caused this militaristic bend in the church leadership. Starving refugees migrating to Missouri after you know planning season had already passed, that puts a lot of pressure on the leadership to keep those people fed during the coming winter. Stealing provisions and burning towns to the ground in their wake, like the Mormons planned to loot their way through the coming winter, but that obviously came at a cost. A divine revelation commanded that theft was God's will, and the Mormons executed that God's will at the point of a gun and bayonet. The question really is, were Joe and Rigdon reacting to events around them, or was there a calculated plan to bring the state to the edge of war for other more grand purposes? The Mormons had a long and troubled past with Missouri for half a decade before Joe and Rigdon ever got out there to begin with and formed their Danites and started preaching this fire and brimstone narrative. But was it all calculated to galvanize the Mormons against a common enemy and to solidify that cult personality? Any group needs a common enemy in order to remain cohesive, and Missouri mobocrats became that common enemy. Intent matters because it's the difference between premeditated murder and manslaughter. And we understand the result, regardless of the intent. But where the intent comes back into focus is when we consider what the end game was. Mormonism from its inception was a revolutionary religion. It sought to overthrow the powers that be and instate a religious empire to rule the world preempting the second coming of Jesus and laying the governmental lattice upon which Jesus would build his kingdom of God on earth. The ideas are very much at the center of the church today, even though the language that's used today is cryptic and it's stated in less defined and kind of more ethereal ways. The intent of today's prophets is just as at question as the intent of Rigdon and Joe in early 1838. Were they preaching this apocalyptic and warlike rhetoric with the intent of preserving the well-being of their people, or were the Mormons merely pawns in a much larger game of world revolution? One of those concepts is focused on the good and the well-being of the people. The other is focused on the aggrandizement of the leadership, and the motivation matters. The intent matters. Jesus said, love thy neighbor, not love thy big ass buildings and bank account. <laughs> Were these Missouri Mormons viewed as people by the leadership or just soldiers to be brokered and pawned? Are Mormons today viewed as people by the leadership or just walking checkbooks? Intent matters. Let's keep that question of intent in our minds as we navigate the final and the most revolutionary era of Joseph Smith's Mormonism, Nauvoo, episodes 53, 54, 55, and 56 for the exodus to Illinois. Once Joseph Smith bust out of jail uh, in Missouri and got settled in Illinois, he petitioned Congress for over a million dollars of reparations for the persecution that the Mormons had suffered in Missouri. That's somewhere in the ballpark of $40 million in 2020 money. Joseph Smith asked personally U.S. President Martin Van Buren for help in getting his petition for redress through Congress. But Van Buren told him, quote, your cause is just, but I can do nothing for you, end quote. Episodes 58 and 61. 
understandably being turned away, this absolutely infuriated the prophet. He was banking on that bailout money to pay for all of the land contracts that he had signed to resettle the Mormons in Illinois. Being denied the government teat, he'd be left to his own devices to build and to expand the fledgling Mormon empire on the Mississippi. The Quincy Whig newspaper reported Joe's reaction to Van Buren's denial, quote, he is not as fit, said he, as my dog for the chair of state, for my dog will make an effort to protect his abused and insulted master, while the present chief magistrate will not do so much as lift a finger to relieve an oppressed and persecuted community of free men, whose glory it has been that they were citizens of the United States, end quote. This rage certainly contributed to Joe's later decision to run for president himself, like when another president roasted a TV personality in just good fun, who then decided to run for POTUS against everything that the previous president stood for, just to prove to all of the libs that he was, you know, a good president, or that's what a good president looks like. Episode 71. At this point in our timeline, we need to introduce Thomas Coke Sharp, episode 77. A Methodist minister's son from Pennsylvania, Thomas Sharp graduated law school but didn't make a very good lawyer because he was partially deaf. So instead, he turned to publishing business and started a newspaper called the Warsaw Signal based in Warsaw, Illinois, not far from Nauvoo. According to its masthead, the Warsaw Signal was, quote, devoted to politics, agriculture, literature, commerce, and general intelligence, end quote. The Warsaw Signal was the single closest paper to this new Mormon headquarters of Nauvoo that wasn't published by the Mormons themselves. So if somebody in the nation wanted to know what those deluded religious fanatics were up to lately, they could go to the Times and Seasons of the Nauvoo neighbor, but that was just a Mormon propaganda rag. They could use another large newspaper outlet— but most of those just reprinted articles from this one little source out of Hancock County written by Thomas Sharp, the Warsaw Signal. Eventually, Thomas Sharp drew the ire of Joe's younger brother, Crazy Willie Smith, in his newspaper, The Wasp, when it would respond to Thomas Sharp's articles in its column titled The Stinger, wherein it would call Thomas Sharp Tom Ass Sharp, with the ass capitalized. Mormons are so clever with their nicknames. Ah, oh, you're killing me, William. On April 7th, 1841, Thomas Sharp reported on the dedication of the new temple site in Nauvoo, Illinois, the previous day. According to Sharp, quote, The number assembled is variously estimated. We should think, however, about seven or 8,000. Some say as high as 12,000. The Nauvoo Legion, consisting of 650 men, was in attendance and, considering the short time they have had to prepare, made a very respectable appearance. General John C. Bennett commanded the Legion under the direction of the Prophet and acquitted himself in a truly officer-like manner." End quote. This article gained national media attention. Just, just sit back and imagine this. Just imagine. If you had heard about the Mormons committing their militant acts of treason, Joseph Smith being locked up in prison and then, you know, bribing his way out of prison, the Mormons raided and burned non-Mormon settlements. They raided military supply trains, and that eventually got them kicked out of Missouri. And then you read in a newspaper one day that the Mormons, because of the Missouri-Mormon War, cost the state of Missouri $150,000, which adjusted for inflation, that's just a hair under $4 million in 2020 money. But then you see an article saying that the Mormons have another army and they just laid the cornerstone for their temple in Illinois, just like they had done in Missouri two years prior. What goes through your mind? How do you deal with that information? What, well, what's the end? How, where does this lead? Where does this end? What is the escalation going to look like in Illinois? Is it going to look anything like the escalation that happened in Missouri? These are some serious questions. Well, here's how a Selma, Alabama newspaper interpreted this, quote, They, the Mormons, do not intend to be driven out of Illinois as they were from Missouri, end quote, which was exactly right. Joe was building a fortress of civil and military power around himself 
in Nunavu, and it took years for his enemies to crack it, though eventually they managed to, but doing so required murdering the guy responsible for the criminal behavior. Episode 66. Joe's great accomplice in building up this edifice of power was John C. Reckett Bennett, a fellow narcissist who had political and military experience that Joe lacked. Bennett converted in 1840, and he helped Joe to write the Nauvoo City Charter soon after Bennett arrived in what was then Commerce, Illinois, the Mormon stronghold. Joe made John C. Bennett the mayor of the Nauvoo, uh, of the city of Nauvoo, as well as his second in command of the Nauvoo Legion. For a couple of years, Joe and Bennett were absolute best buds. Bennett even owned and operated a Nauvoo brothel with Joe's tacit approval in addition to running the city's abortion clinic to deal with the temporal consequences of celestial marriage. Episode 67, 141, and of course the Bennett Meltdown, episodes 120 through 134. But then Bennett got caught seducing women way too openly and, of course, telling them that Joe had taught him that adultery wasn't sinful. As a result, Joe went into damage control mode. Joe knew that he needed to distance himself from Bennett and to make an example of him. And on May 14, 1842, Bennett's last act as a mayor was to sign an order for the destruction of all brothels in Nauvoo. Remember, Bennett owned one of Nauvoo's brothels. So this order was specifically directed at his personal sex trafficking business, episode 119. And I don't know exactly how to interpret this, and I would love to be a fly on the wall for that city council meeting to figure out exactly what went down. Five days after Bennett signed that order, he resigned from the office of mayor and renounced his membership from the church or was excommunicated. There's a little dispute about what actually happened there. So it seems like Bennett initially participated in the damage control, sort of, and to try to cover up to protect Joe's reputation from the fallout from Bennett's spiritual wifery system. In private, Joe talked about Bennett like they were still good friends and that they had parted on good terms, but Bennett felt like Joe had thrown him under the bus and that Joe was growing way too powerful. And within a month, their relationship took a hard turn for the worse. Bennett went public with all of the sordid details of Joe's spiritual wife doctrine in a series of letters that were published in the Sangamo Journal. And Joe had the Danites follow Bennett to Carthage and threaten to murder him. Eventually, all of Bennett's letters were compiled with extensive other data and sold as a book titled History of the Saints. And of course, listeners of this show on the Patreon exclusive feed, people who support the show with your hard-earned money, you can listen to the entire book, the, the entire History of the Saints, along with my commentary. Joe's younger brother, Crazy Willie Smith, who actually had a brothel of his own, had started his own newspaper outlet called The Wasp, which took on anybody who was writing articles in opposition to the Mormon propagandist narrative. And Thomas Coke Sharp, (laughs) Tom Ass Sharp of the Warsaw Signal, was a frequent target of Crazy Willie's Wasp propaganda. On June 25th, 1842, the Wasp published this threat against Bennett, quote, unless he, meaning Bennett, is determined to bring sudden destruction upon himself from the hand of the Almighty, he will be silent, end quote. Four days after that was published, a group of Danites sneaked up on Bennett's house in the middle of the night to try and assassinate him. But Bennett had been forewarned, and he armed himself to the teeth, and he scared the assassins off that night. Obviously, working by direction of the prophet, assassins like this would have a few other notable failed attempts on the life of William Marks and William Law and a few other public defectors from the faith that we're going to get into here pretty soon. But Joe... In all of this, during this whole period, built up the Nauvoo Legion to give Mormon military power a legal legitimacy that the Danites lacked in Missouri. However, Joe also kept a few Danite henchmen around him to conduct operations off of the Nauvoo Legion books. Now, one of his childhood friends, Oren Porter Rockwell, (laughs) was a man who was short and stout, and he liked his whiskey. 
Porter Rockwell's eyes were like portals into black oblivion and his receding hairline only revealed more of the demonic features comprising his face as the years kind of wore on. Now, he may have been eight years Joseph's junior, but Rockwell and Joe were rough and tumble, scrappy young lads that were causing trouble in Palmyra since their friendship was forged at a young age. If you mess with Joseph Smith... You'd have to keep an eye on your back for his best friend and closest personal bodyguard, Orin Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell, episode 142. Pistol Pack and Porter had been the leader of the Destroying Angel Company of the Danites throughout the 1838 Missouri-Mormon conflict, but he remained in the shadows. He'd participated in the looting and the burning of the non-Mormon towns around the Mormon settlements, uh, and he never left Joe's side as the standoff continued to heat up between the Missouri militia and the Mormon mob there that eventually ended in Joe's arrest. How does a pious prophet of the Lord deal with his sharpest critics? Thomas Sharp, editor of the Warsaw Signal, was met with public derision by the Mormon machine. Joe, in his propaganda outlets, constantly criticized Thomas Sharp for his articles that he wrote in the Warsaw Signal. But there were a few people, like Grandison Newell and John C. Bennett, who posed enough of a threat for Joseph Smith that he wanted them to be put out of the way to be given over to the buffetings of Satan, as it was said, to have them assassinated. Another of those people was ex-governor, former governor, Lilburn W. Boggs, public enemy number one in the eyes of the Mormons. The man who had been pinned for the treatment of the Mormons during the Missouri-Mormon War, instead of the blame resting on Joe and Rigdon, where it rightfully belonged, the vengeful arm of the Lord would be swift and deadly. Orin Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell's wife, Luna Rockwell, was eight months pregnant with their fourth child. Now, Port and Luna decided to have the baby with Luna's parents, who were then living in Independence, Missouri. And in late February of 1842, Porter packed up a wagon with a few provisions and sent the other three kids to live with some family friends in Nauvoo for a few weeks. And Porter and the pregnant Luna departed for Nauvoo. On the evening of May 6th, 1842, Pistol Pack and Porter tucked his wife away in bed as she nursed the new baby. Now, Port loved horses and carriages. He was an expert horse rider. Now, he had just gotten a job in Independence taking care of a valuable stallion in order to financially support his family for the brief time that they'd be staying in Missouri until the baby was old enough to travel back to Nauvoo, where they called home. Porter saddled up and he rode the couple of miles under the cover of nightfall on the night of May 6th to the home of former Governor Lilburn Boggs. Porter Rockwell loaded a pistol with a hot load, lots of extra power and lots of extra buckshot to make sure that when Boggs was hit with that shot, there'd be no chance of survival. The Destroying Angel of Mormonism, the great man of God, son of thunder, crouched outside the office of former Governor Lilburn Boggs' home, peering into the window, eyeing his prey. And Port saw the back of Boggs' head lined up in the sight beads of his pistol that was loaded with buckshot. The hammer of his pistol crashed into the cap, igniting that heavy load in the pistol's chamber. Now, the buckshot smashed through the window and hit true to its target. Two small lead balls entered uh, Lilburn Boggs's head, one of them implanted in his skull and the other one broke his jaw. And two more balls entered his throat, one of which entered his esophagus, which he swallowed as Boggs gasped in surprise at the gunshot and the crashing window noises. And of course, immediately a spell of incredible pain and trauma suddenly overtook his body, which rendered him immediately unconscious. This shot was so powerful that the gun kicked out of Porter's hand into the puddle beneath the broken window, and Porter fled the scene without picking up the pistol. When the sheriff came to discover the crime scene, he found the gun, and he showed it to a storekeeper uh, by the name of Ullinger, 
who recognized the weapon as one that had been stolen from his shop just that day or maybe the day earlier. And Olinger said in reply to this, quote, I thought the niggers had taken it, but that hired man of wards, the one who used to work with the stallion, he came in and took it just before it turned up missing, end quote. That hired man of wards that, that Olinger was talking about, that was Pistol Pack and Porter who had hired on to take care of that valuable horse. The investigators had their first lead as to who Governor Boggs' assassin might be. A mere two weeks later, Pistol Pack and Porter arrived back in Nauvoo off of a Mississippi steamer, having permanently left his wife with their new child back in Missouri. He was never seen by any of the local officials in Missouri after that assassination attempt, and he made the 300-mile journey back to Nauvoo in less than two weeks, arriving in Nauvoo two days before news of Boggs' assassination reached Nauvoo. Porter actually traveled from Missouri to Nauvoo faster than the news did, which was quite a feat at the time. The next day, Joe announced Boggs' death on the stand. Like Port, Joe wrongly assumed that the assassination had been successful. Episode 109. It wasn't long before rumors started to fly around about who was responsible. And Thomas Sharp heard from John C. Bennett, who had recently defected from the church, that, quote, Orrin Porter Rockwell started suddenly from Nauvoo about two weeks before Boggs' assassination that he, Bennett, asked Joe where Rockwell had gone and that Joe replied that he had gone to Missouri to fulfill prophecy. He says further that Rockwell returned to Nauvoo on the very day that the news of Governor Boggs' assassination arrived. Since that, the prophet has presented said Rockwell with a carriage and horse or horses, and he had suddenly become very flush of money and lives in style, end quote. The primary enemy of the Mormons from the Missouri Mormon War gets shot, nearly dies. The Mormon leader shot thought that he had died from it. And the shot should have been fatal. He got hit with four balls of hot lead, two of which entered his head, two of them entered his neck. That should have killed him. And then the primary suspect in the act is suddenly rolling around town in Nauvoo with a brand new carriage with plenty of whiskey money to burn. What this illustrates to us today is... If you did good for the prophet, he, he, he had your back. If you carried out his vengeful prophecies, you'd be handsomely rewarded. Underscoring just how powerful and malevolent the Mormon kingdom on the Mississippi had become, a reprint of Sharp's article about the Boggs assassination attempt in Oregon Port Rockwell was published in the Brooklyn Evening Star, and it included this addendum, quote, the Kaskaskian Republican contains a long account of a murder committed on the 2nd of June upon John Stevenson, a Mormon, and supposed to have been committed by Mormons who had called upon him for contributions to build the temple at Nauvoo and had been refused. Joe's Danites in full force to carry out his will by any means necessary, end quote. Then there's another addendum which discusses the hurdles to making Joe answer for the crimes as the Nauvoo Legion had been armed by state-provided weapons and a whole lot of state-provided weapons. Quote, we have late information from Nauvoo. Joe Smith anticipates a requisition upon Governor Carlin from Governor Reynolds of Missouri for his person because he was a suspect in assassinating Governor Boggs and is determined not to be given up. He has all the state arms, some 20 or 30 cannon, a large number of muskets, Jaegers, pistols, and cutlasses, all belonging to the state which he is prepared to use against the state authorities if they shall attempt to deliver him to Governor Reynolds. Joe reiterates that he will not be given up, and the Mormons say that the prophet shall not be taken while any of them are left to defend him." End quote. Crazy Willie Smith's newspaper, The Wasp, was quite gleeful to see Boggs suffer at the end of an unknown assassin's gun barrel with articles like this, 
tacitly implicating Joe in the assassination plot, which is crazy because it's his own older brother. Uh, Crazy Willie quoted the Quincy Wicks saying that, quote, Smith too, the Mormon prophet, as we understand, prophesied a year or so ago his, Boggs's, death by violent means. Hence, there is plenty of foundation for rumor, end quote. Joe did give that prophecy <laughs> that Governor Boggs would die by violent means. And Joe also said that Governor Carlin of Illinois would find himself in a ditch, which that prophecy never actually did happen. But the Wasp ended up denying that Joe ever stated such things about either governor after it had already printed that article, uh, the commentary on the Quincy Wig article. Here's Joe's response to the Quincy Wig article that was published in The Wasp. In your paper, you have done me manifest injustice in inscribing to me a prediction of the demise of Lilburn W. Boggs by violent hands. Boggs was a candidate for the state senate, and I presume fell by the hand of a political opponent. With his hands and face yet dripping with the blood of murder, talking about the Mormon, uh, what the Mormons suffered, right? But he died not through my instrumentality. My hands are clean and my heart pure from the blood of all men. I am tired of the misrepresentations, calumny, and detraction heaped upon me by wicked men and desire and claim only those principles guaranteed to all men by the Constitution and laws of the United States and of Illinois, end quote. You know, meaning guilt, you know, innocent until proven guilty. But the point Joe makes here, yeah, Boggs is super duper a public figure. He was former governor. He was running for state senate. He did have political enemies. But Boggs wasn't a controversial figure in any other regard beyond the Mormon issue. In fact, Boggs is pretty popular in Missouri, actually. A letter to the editor of the Hawkeye out of Missouri stated, quote, Boggs, although so strongly accused by these renegades, Mormons, was one of the most inoffensive men I ever knew. I knew him well and for years, and I did not know him, or and I did not know, with the exception of the Mormons, that he had a personal enemy on earth, end quote. The fact of the matter is that the Wasp's response was pure propaganda. By my understanding of the evidence, this is all Port and Joe's work, no question about it. Historians today disagree about whether or not Bog or you know Porter actually pulled the trigger on Boggs, but that's largely based on belief of Joe's statements against the overwhelming evidence pointing to him and Porter as the responsible parties. Coming out of all of this, John C. Bennett composed a series of sensational letters for publication in the Sangamo Journal, exposing Joseph Smith and telling what Bennett knew about the whole Boggs affair. Bennett said, Rockwell had been sent to kill Boggs on Joseph's orders. Quote, In the spring of the year, Smith offered a reward of $500 to any man who would secretly assassinate Governor Boggs. End quote. And after the attempt was made, Bennett related, quote, Smith said to me, speaking of Governor Boggs, the destroying angel has done the work, as I predicted, but... Rockwell was not the man who shot. The angel did it, end quote. Porter Rockwell, Pistol Pack and Porter, later showed up at Bennett's house to threaten him for making these allegations in the Sangamo Journal. Now, what Port took issue with wasn't the claim that Porter had shot Boggs. It was a part about getting paid for it that Porter didn't like. Porter said that if Bennett made such a claim again that he'd be back. And of course, this, such a statement, I would be back, th that carried all the implications that Ben needed to be on high alert that the Danites were working to try and make him disappear. But Ben was enough of a public figure that that carried a certain level of insurance with it. Now, Port and Joe briefly got arrested for the Boggs assassination in 1842, but they escaped when, when the arresting officers left them temporarily in the custody of a Mormon sheriff. And he, of course, let him go. When the Adams County officers returned to try and extradite the prisoners to Missouri for the crimes, Joe and Porter Rockwell were nowhere to be found. The sheriff tried tailing Emma to Joe's hiding place, but 
Emma, she was a she was a good egg. She was a smart cookie who was really good at cleaning cleaning up her husband's messes. Uh, so she gave the cops the slip before they could follow her back to Joe's hiding place. But Port later got arrested again in March of 1843 when bounty hunters caught up with him in Philadelphia as he was heading back to Nauvoo to officially come out of hiding. They took two pistols and a Bowie knife off of him when they arrested him, and then they carried him back to St. Louis, where he was arraigned and then transported to jail in Jefferson City. Porter Rockwell was confined to the Independence Jail for quite a while as the state decided exactly what to do with him and how to charge him. The problem is, the state wanted to charge him with assault with intent to kill, because Boggs survived it. It wasn't actually murder. He survived the assassination attempt, but it was assault with intent to kill. But the state simply didn't have evidence to prove that it was Pistol Pack and Porter who pulled the trigger on Boggs. All they had was a statement from a guy who owned the shop from which the pistol had gone missing. That's all. That's all they really had him on. But they also wanted to get Porter Rockwell on the old charges with all of the Mormon depredations back in 1838 during the Missouri-Mormon War, but they had even less evidence for that. They kept him locked up for a couple of months, but then he tried to escape. He sawed through his chains, he jumped his jailer, and then he made a run for it, but Porter Rockwell was out of shape from his long confinement, and he couldn't keep running to stay out of their hands. So the sheriff recaptured him and an angry mob gathered around trying to lynch him but the sheriff clapped him in heavier chains and then put porter rockwell in solitary confinement for nearly a month with his wrists chained to his ankles i can't imagine like ah oh, god that is terrible torture finally in late may 1843 porter rockwell is brought to court and a grand jury failed to indict him on the assassination charge, but they indicted him for trying to escape. And he spent most of the rest of 1843 in chains before his eventual release and his triumphant return on Christmas 1843 when Joseph Smith mistook his old friend from Palmyra era, Pistol Back and Porter Rockwell, for a, uh, a ruffian Missourian who was just causing trouble in Joe's downstairs bar. Episodes 142 and 164. While all of this was going on in Missouri with Porter Rockwell, back in Nauvoo, Joe made the acquaintance of one Joseph H. Jackson. Jackson claims that he was just infiltrating the Mormons in order to expose Joseph Smith, but then he represented himself to Joe as a desperado and a potential uh, criminal accomplice. Jackson mentioned that uh, to Joe that he could help break Porter Rockwell out of jail. Quote, well, said Joe, if you will release Porter and kill old Boggs, I will give you $3,000, end quote. And according to Jackson, quote, Joe and I took a ride of some five miles on the prairie. All the way out and back, he pressed me to kill Boggs and said he would pay me well for it. Finally, I gave him a strong hint that I was in for the business, knowing as I did that if I hesitated, he would suspect me of treachery, and thus all my plans in relation to him would be frustrated, plans of infiltrating the Mormons. I therefore carried on my game by showing a bold front. All the while he was urging the killing of Boggs, he insisted that it was the will of God, and in God's name he offered me a reward for his blood. This was all done with an air of sanctimonious gravity and with a look of innocence that would make one almost believe that the prophet really thought that he was acting under the command of heaven. I was utterly astonished to see this man concoct the most hellish plans for murder and revenge, and yet with pertinacity insist that it was right in the sight of God, end quote. Yeah, Jackson wouldn't believe some of the stuff that Joe had done his entire career. He got to know Joe at the very height, uh, but all the stuff, he didn't know Joe for the entire 12 years preceding all of these events. So Jackson ended up going to Missouri at Joe's behest, of course, but he actually couldn't get into the jail to see Porter Rockwell. And when he tried to get 
to Boggs to uh, you know finish off the Boggs job. Boggs was unfortunately for Jackson out of town, so he couldn't have carried out Joe's plan even if he wanted to. Jackson's real plan, or so he claimed, had been to get into C. Porter Rockwell to try and elicit a confession, but that also failed. Episode 144. In June of 1843, Joseph Smith was arrested again while visiting Emma's sister in Dixon, Illinois. However, Joe's bodyguard, Stephen Markham, Piggy Bank Steve, was present when the Missouri Sheriff Joseph Reynolds and Illinois Sheriff Harmon T. Wilson took Joe into custody by the force of pistol. Markham alerted the Mormon troops, immediately rode out from Dixon straight to Nauvoo, which is over 100 miles, immediately rode back to Nauvoo and alerted all of the Mormons of what had just happened, that the prophet was arrested by people who were by the sheriffs who were trying to extradite him to Missouri. And then a mix of Danites and Nauvoo legionnaires immediately rode out of Nauvoo and they intercepted the sheriffs and liberated Joseph Smith by force. Episodes 144 through 147. Joe had escaped accountability once again, but this latest arrest raised a question. How did the sheriffs know that Joseph Smith would be in Dixon, Illinois, without a posse of bodyguards? How did they know that he would be vulnerable? As Joe headed into the last two years of his life, he faced a rising tide of dissent from within the Mormon community. With a growing number of church leaders opposed to polygamy, Joe grew increasingly paranoid that someone might sell him out, like when he made a trip unguarded to Dixon, Illinois. In particular, Joe focused on Hinchpin Sidney Rigdon, who had been on the outs with Joe ever since his daughter, Nancy, rejected a marriage proposal from Joe in early 1842, episode 117. On August 13th, 1842, Joe announced from the stand that, quote, there is a certain man in this city who has made a covenant to betray and give me up. And that, too, before the Governor Carlin commenced his persecution. This testimony I have from gentlemen from abroad, and I do not wish to give their names, end quote. If Joe really did receive intelligence about a traitor in church leadership who had, you know, entered a covenant to betray him, that almost certainly referred to Joseph H. Jackson. Joseph H. Jackson was the guy who told Joe about that, that, that dissenter, or maybe Jackson himself was the person who was a dissenter. Joe was deliberately ambiguous with his language here in hopes that somebody would come forward or step forward or squeal. Jackson made an agreement with Sheriff Wilson to help expose Joseph Smith and bring him to justice prior to him infiltrating the Mormon leadership. And this fits because Joseph Jackson was nearly assassinated just a couple months after Joe made the statement while he was riding a supply wagon and while he was at the beginning process of trying to infiltrate the Mormon leadership. However, Joe apparently believed that the traitor at this time was actually Hinchpin Rigdon. Joe had also repeatedly accused Rigdon, Nauvoo's postmaster, of withholding his mail or giving his mail to spies and to enemies within the church. Also, Joe claimed that Rigdon isn't really kind of pulling his weight around here. What would you say you do around here, Rigdon? And, you know, Joe was kind of sick of carrying around this deadbeat. And so... Joe declared from the stand that he wanted Rigdon removed as a counselor in the First Presidency and disfellowshipped from the church. There's a lot of complicated factors that go into the very uh, controversial relationship between Joe and Rigdon. Historian Richard Van Wagner, in his biography of Sidney Rigdon, A Portrait of Religious Excess, suggests that Joe had an ulterior motive in making these accusations about Sidney Rigdon uh, concerning the, his office as Postmaster General. Money. Money. And trace it all back to money. A constant flow of money from a government contract. That was a delicious little treat that Joe couldn't stand watching somebody else consume. From Richard Van Wagner's biography of Sidney Rigdon titled A Portrait of Religious Excess Quote. From the earliest Nauvoo settlement years, Smith was envious that George W. Robinson, then Sidney Rigdon, held the financially lucrative position of postmaster. 
In the midst of the Bennett controversy, Smith initiated a campaign to attain the postmastership for himself. He may have also wanted to monitor mail from such apostates as John C. Bennett, Francis Higby, and George W. Robinson. Because postal matters and the Rigdon family were outside of his control, Smith attempted to slander the Rigdons by asserting that the mails were regularly plundered and mishandled, end quote. Now, Rigdon was allowed to respond to these allegations, and of course, Rigdon denied all of it. And there's no evidence to conclude one way or another whether or not Rigdon did manipulate the mail. Rigdon also provided explanations for some specific cases when the mail had been delayed. And then he, quote, closed with a moving appeal to President Joseph Smith concerning their former friendships, associations, and sufferings, and expressed his willingness to resign his place, though with sorrowful and indescribable feelings. During this address, the sympathies of the congregation were highly excited. End quote. The rest of the meeting included Almond W. Babbitt, Hiram Smith, and William Law, all testifying on Rigdon's behalf. Joe was the problem here. And Joe stood up and made a final statement saying that, oh, he's now satisfied that Rigdon wasn't a traitor and he's willing to keep him in his post, but only if Rigdon promised to do better from now on, whatever that means. Now, a newspaper reported this. It says that, quote, Sidney Rigdon was brought up by the prophet and abused without measure. And they did, that he had cried for mercy like a whipped puppy, end quote. That's probably an exaggeration, but Rigdon's oratory abilities were powerful and they were convincing to Joe and to the rest of the people in the high council that day who all suddenly became very friendly to Rigdon, even though he had previously been on the outs for like a year and a half to almost two years by this point. However, that still left Joe with the question, who was the traitor in church leadership who leaked the information about Joe Bean and Dixon to Sheriff Harmon T. Wilson? One candidate that Joe came up with was Emma Smith, his very own first wife. On November 5th, 1843, Joe recorded in his journal that he was, quote, taken suddenly sick at the dinner table, went to the door and vomited all dinner, jaw dislocated, and raised fresh blood, every symptom of poison, end quote. Since Emma was the one who served him dinner that night, Joe jumped to the conclusion that she was the culprit who tried to poison him, and was therefore maybe the person who fed the information to Harmony e. Wilson that they'd be in Dixon, Illinois, when Joe was vulnerable. According to Bloody Brigham Young in 1866, when... Brigham was amidst a constant multiple decades long character assassination campaign against Emma, quote, not six months before the death of Joseph, he called his wife into a secret council and there he told her the truth and called upon her to deny it if she could. He told her that the judgments of God would come upon her forthwith if she did not repent. He told her of the time she undertook to poison him. And he told her that she was a child of hell and literally the most wicked woman on this earth, that there was not one more wicked than she. He told her where she got the poison and how she put it into a cup of coffee. Said he, you got that poison so-and-so and I drank it, but you could not kill me. When it entered his stomach, he went to the door and threw it off. He spoke to her in that council in a very severe manner, and she never said one word in reply, end quote. Now, it seems pretty unlikely that Emma actually tried to poison Joseph Smith, and it also doesn't seem like Joe stayed mad at her for very long after this, although what is actually recorded in documentary evidence it only provides a very brief window into their relationship. There's a whole lot that's very enigmatic about what really went on in the Smith family home. Bloody Brigham reports Joe saying that she was the most wicked woman on earth, but at the same time, Joe told several people that she was the most virtual woman, woman on earth and that he would do anything to save her. Historian uh, Linda King Newell argues that Joe had frequent bouts of bloody vomiting 
because he probably had stomach ulcers because he was a stressed out guy all the time. And that, in fact, it was Emma who nursed Joseph Smith through many of these episodes of vomiting. She thinks that Emma probably managed to convince Joe that she wasn't guilty. With that said, it's not impossible that Emma tried to poison him. Emma had threatened divorce quite a few times, and Joe had employed quote-unquote harsh measures to get those notions of divorce out of her head. What those harsh measures actually were, we, we don't know. She couldn't charge him with adultery and survive such charges, and nobody would believe it because the Mormon propaganda machine was so powerful. So if Joseph Smith died, sure, Emma would be sad, but everything in her life that was causing her trouble would immediately be gone. There isn't a bedrock on this poisoning issue, and reasonable historians disagree about it to this day. Episode 164. So, with Emma off the table, Joe's next two candidates for the who the traitor was were William Marks and William Law, episodes 178 and 179. William Law began as just a run-of-the-mill merchant and a physician, but in Nauvoo, he became a member of the Nauvoo City Council and aide-de-camp to the Lieutenant General of the Nauvoo Legion, meaning he was one of Joe's personal military advisors, in addition to being second counselor in the First Presidency to replace Frederick G. Williams after Frederick G. Williams' untimely and mysterious death in 1842, episode 135. In 1842... Joseph Smith considered William Law to be one of his warmest friends who met him in his time of need when Joe was hiding from the constables who were trying to arrest him. Because William Law had led the troop of Nauvoo Legionnaires who found Joe when he was in their custody, when in the custody of Sheriffs Wilson and Reynolds following his arrest in Dixon. That's episode 144. But by late 1843, which coincidentally was the same year that A Christmas Carol was published by Charles Dickens. Joe and William Law's relationship was shifting very quickly. When Joe got up and told the Mormons to vote for the Whig candidate, Cyrus Walker, William Law got up and publicly disagreed with the prophet, episode 162. And when Joe taught William Law the doctrine of polygamy, Law rejected it instantly, episodes 148, 149, and 199. According to Joseph H. Jackson, William Law had always dismissed the rumors about polygamy as Gentile slanders. Quote, when, however, this new revelation, that's Doctrine and Covenants 132, was made known to him, his eyes were opened and at once he indignantly rejected the doctrines as not of God, but of the devil. End quote. And of course, at the same time, Nauvoo stake president William Marks had a similar experience. Hiram sidekick of Biff Smith, Joe's older brother, created more dissenters on August 12, 1843, when he read Joe's Celestial Marriage Revelation, now Doctrine and Covenants 132, to the Nauvoo High Council. William Marks, who was president at the meeting and heard Hiram read the revelation out loud, quote, felt that it was not true, end quote. Dissent is boiling up through all of the ranks into the very closest circles of the inner ring of trusted Mormon leadership. Joseph H. Jackson, also this this, this anti-Mormon dissenter, also claimed that Joe had tried to seduce both William Law's wife, Jane, and William Marks's 15-year-old daughter, Sophia, and both of them had been had rejected the prophet. William Law later denied that Joan made an attempt on Jane, but he may have just been protecting Jane's honor in this Victorian era America. There is corroboration for the claim about Sophia Marx, William uh, Marx's daughter. Eliza Jane Churchill Webb wrote in a letter in 1876, quote, William Marx was an influential man in the church left because Joseph was determined to have his daughter Sophia Marx sealed to him, end quote. So vehement were Law and Marx in rejecting the doctrine of polygamy that Joe started making plans to kill them. Jackson says that Joe expressed, quote, his determination to put Law out of the way. To put somebody out of the way or to give somebody over to the buffetings of Satan, those are euphemisms for murdering them. Quote, for he had become dangerous to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and that it was the will of God that he should be removed. He, however, 
wished to proceed in such a manner that he would be able to get Law's wife, end quote. <laughs> it's just so brazen. It's so arrogant, isn't it? He wanted to kill somebody whose wife he wanted, but he wanted to do it in such a way that the guy could be killed and he would still get the guy's wife. At this same time, Joe also expressed a desire to kill William Marks. Now, this is a dangerous pattern that I've worked to highlight all episode. When somebody couldn't be bought or silenced, they needed to be removed. And Joe had an army of people behind him to complete such an act in different ways. Whether it was his captains in polygamy who'd get on a man's good graces and mix a white powder in with his victuals, or... It was Pistol Pack and Porter on an escapade across state lines to shoot a man who was just reading in his study. A little cabal of Mormon leaders were willing to move mountains to carry out the will of the Lord's prophet. Joe explained to Jackson how he intended to do the deed of removing William Law while trying to acquire Jane as yet another wife. Like, the guy always had to escalate the danger and the taboo nature of his pursuits, didn't he? It was never enough. He never could have enough. It was greed. It's just gluttonous almost. At his direction, the city council had given Joe power to raise a police force of 40 men, all of whom were Danites. They were all Danites. These men all swore an oath to protect Joseph Smith and his household, quote, in every measure that I may deem lawful in the sight of God, murder and treason not accepted, so help you God, end quote. This dedicated police force was the perfect weapon. Danites in uniform. Police captain Jonathan Dunham would select five men to do the work of putting William Law and William Marks out of the way. Law and Marks would go missing, quote, and then all make a great noise about it and call it persecutions. This is quoting Jackson, uh, who is quoting Joseph. Now said he, ain't this a damn good plan to get rid of traitors? End quote. Jackson knew that he couldn't just stand by and listen passively to this whole plot to kill a friend of his because Jackson was friends with William Law. So he spoke up in Law's and Marx's favor. According to Jackson, quote, Joe accused me of tying his hands and said he could do nothing if opposed, end quote. We know for a fact that this isn't just a story that Jackson made up because the church's own records corroborate that Joe was trying to kill William Law and Marx. According to the history of the church, volume six, uh, 17 days after Joe created the Nauvoo police force, Joe gave a speech to the police force in which he revealed the, <laughs> that he intended to have the police kill traitors. Quote, police captain Jonathan Dunham is the man to send after a thief, a thief being euphemistic here. He will not come back after following him a mile to ask if he may shoot him if he resists. Some men have strange ears and changeable hearts. They become transformed from their original purity and integrity and become altogether different from what they were. My life is more in danger than some little doughhead of a fool in this city than from all my numerous and inveterate enemies abroad. I am exposed to far greater danger from traitors among ourselves than from enemies without." And if I can escape from the ungrateful treachery of assassins, I can live as Caesar might have lived, were it not for a right-hand Brutus. We have a Judas in our midst, end quote. A few days later, William Law told Hiram Sidekick of Biff Smith, Joe's older brother, that one of the Danite policemen had warned him that the police were watching and that they were going to try and kill him if they saw any sign of disloyalty or saw him in a vulnerable place. Hiram, of course, was aghast because of course Hiram was. Hiram could do no wrong. He was a completely reasonable guy. So Hiram then went to Joe Smith, who said that the police, oh, they must have misunderstood his instructions. The next day, Joe held a city council meeting at which... William Law testified that policeman Eli Norton had told him under Masonic oath that Joe had sworn other policeman Daniel Carn to kill William Law within three months. In response, Norton was called to testify on the stand and he waffled around a little bit saying that he had only uh, had an intimation of all of this, not any specific knowledge. And then Daniel Carn was called up to testify and he denied having taken 
any private oath whatsoever. And of course, they all played dumb. And Joseph Smith himself denied all of this too, declared that, quote, the Danite system never had any existence, end quote. However, Joe also chastised the police for their failure to keep a secret, episode 178 and 199. Two days after this city council meeting, the issue arose again when William Marks complained, according to Hiram Smith, that he too had received multiple warnings that the police were going to try and kill him. According to William Law, Joseph, quote, became very angry that any should have fears or suspect that he would encourage such a thing and said that he had a good mind to put the police on us anyhow. We were such fools or words to that effect, end quote. This comment that... <laughs> Oh, you're crazy for thinking that I would have put the, the police on you to assassinate you. you. Just because you suspect me of doing it, I might as well send the police on you. This comment infuriated Wilson Law so much, that's William's older brother, that he drew a pistol on Joseph Smith and he had to be restrained from blowing away Joe right then and there. Another city council meeting was held in which several witnesses testified that Joe considered Marx as a traitor, a Brutus or a Judas within the ranks, and that the policeman had been heard threatening to kill William Marx. And Joe, of course, once again, he denied everything. He denied that he intended to kill William Law or William Marx, but he also made clear that he considered Marx to be a satanic traitor, and he again chastised the witnesses for failing to keep a secret. Really, it's all about priorities here. Oh, I never, I never had a plan to kill you, William Marks. I just really, really wish that my policeman could keep a damn secret. <laughs> you know, unrelated, unrelated thought, and he just digressed for a few minutes. Soon after all of this, this all of this chaos and all of these, this backbiting, all not knowing who he could trust, Joe eventually disbanded his police force. Seems like a good idea in some cases. You know, maybe we could adopt something like that today. Of course, like these events all preceded the formation of William Law's church, which called Joe a fallen prophet and then published the novel Expositor, the destruction of which killed the prophet and his brother. Now, these events are all really tightly connected. When somebody became a threat, Joe wanted to kill them before they could kill him. According to William Law, later in his life, this conspiracy with the police wasn't the only way that Joe tried to kill him. Quote, they tried to get rid of me in different ways. One was my poisoning. I was already out of the church when Hiram called one day, invited me for the next day to a reconciliation dinner, as he called it to his house. He said Joseph would come too. He invited me and my wife. He was very urgent about the matter, but I declined the invitation. Now, I must tell you that I, in those dangerous days, did not neglect to look out somewhat for the safety of my person, and that I kept a detective or two among those who were in the confidence of the Smiths. <laughs> he had spies in the prophet's ring just as much as Joe had spies all around the city. I love that. That very same evening of the day on which Hiram had been to my house inviting me, my detective told me that they had conceived a plan to poison me at the reconciliation dinner. The object was a double one. My going to dinner would have been would have shown to the people that I was reconciled and my death would have freed them of an enemy. You may imagine that I didn't regret having declined that amiable invitation. End quote. William Law believed that six or seven people who died at Nauvoo were poisoned by Joseph Smith, episode 199. If we believe Jackson's account, it was damned easy for one of Joe's wives to poison those men with some white powder during their conjugal encounter, episode 161. And as we head into the year 1844, things really get pretty hot for Joe. One human only has so much ire to give before devolving into complete tyrannical madness. William and Wilson Law started to oppose Joe more and more openly. Charles A. Foster, Robert D. Foster had the Law's brothers back, and so did Chauncey and Francis Higby, who suspected that Joe had murdered their father two years earlier. The Foster brothers had emigrated from England in 1831. They joined the Mormon Church in Illinois in 1839. Robert Foster quickly entered into Joe's inner circles, and he served as his personal scribe while Joe uh, went out to Washington, D.C. in order to petition Congress as well as um, President Martin Van Buren for redress because of the Missouri Mormon War. In D.N.C. Uh, section 124, the God voice in Joe's head commanded Robert D. Foster to build Joe a house. How convenient is that? Oh, how great would that be? 
Thus saith the Lord, build me a house. Thus saith the Lord, buy me an airplane. Thus saith the Lord, I need a new mansion. Well, Robert D. Foster, Dr. Bob the Builder Foster, built Joe this mansion house, but it became a sore spot because Joe constantly complained that Foster wasn't building the house fast enough. It was, it's a big house. It stands to this day. Joe also suspected Foster of passing information to John C. Reckett Bennett after Bennett had left the church and started publishing his exposés in the Sangamo Journal. Robert E. Foster remained pretty loyal to Joseph Smith through 1843, partly because Foster made a whole bunch of money buying and selling stock in the Nauvoo House Association. But the Foster brothers didn't like the idea of polygamy, and by early 1844, they began to align themselves with the leadership who knew that it was being practiced, but who opposed it, like William Law. Apparently, Willard Richards also tried to seduce Robert Foster's wife, which may have kind of, you know, broke the seal of secrecy, episode 197. The Higbert brothers, uh, Francis and Chauncey, they joined the LDS Church with their family in 1832 at ages 11 and 12. They moved to Missouri in 1833, and they suffered through all the expulsion from Jackson County. And in 1838, uh, Francis Higby even fought in the Missouri Mormon War as a Danite. In Nauvoo, both Francis and Chauncey Higby were appointed aides to camp in the Nauvoo Legion, which made them high-ranking assistants to Major General John C. Bennett, which means that they were immediately suspect because they were more loyal to Bennett than they were to Joseph Smith prior to Bennett's defection. Now, when the sex scandal that brought down Bennett broke, Chauncey Higby was implicated and excommunicated along with Bennett. Francis Higby was Nancy Rigdon's boyfriend and was not happy about Joe propositioning her or sexually assaulting her, to put it more accurately. So both the Higby boys ended up siding with Bennett in his departure from the church, and they ended up helping Bennett collect affidavits in order to expose Joseph Smith. Now, of course, Joe wasn't happy with all of this, and he sent the Mormon propaganda mill into full spin mode to try and destroy the, H the Higby's credibility. In a letter that he wrote to Joe, Francis Higby gives a sample of the sorts of things that Joe had been saying about him. Quote, It is said, I seek the hours of the midnight assassin to seize my victim when no one is near to bear witness of the crime or attest the unhallowed deed, that I sympathize with the afflicted and oppressed, that I may devour their vitals, that I seek the mantle of religion to envelop my scorpion body, that I may better practice my nefarious designs, end quote. Those are the accusations that Joe was firing at Francis Higby. And like Joe was trying to stir up the Mormon mob against the Higbys by declaring them to be satanic murderers uh, in cannibals, apparently scorpions in human form projection much Joe by March 24th, 1844, Joe claimed to have received specific intelligence that this entire group of dissenters, the Higbees, the Fosters, the Laws, Bennett, Joseph Jackson, they all planned to assassinate him. He declared publicly, quote, The names of the persons revealed at the head of the conspiracy are as follows. Chauncey L. Higbee, Dr. Robert D. Foster, Mr. Mr. Joseph H. Jackson, and William and Wilson Law, end quote. He publicly said that to a group of Mormons who were attending his sermon. He named the enemies of the kingdom of God among the ranks. And on April 18th, 1844, Joe excommunicated the laws as well as the fosters in absentia, thus setting into motion the sequence of events that landed him in Carthage jail. Episode 196. Then one day near the end of April, 1844, Apostle Orson Spencer got into a fight with his brother, Augustine Spencer. John P. Green, the city marshal, ran up to the Foster Brothers and Chauncey Higby and said, Hey, you're officers of the Nauvoo Legion. I'm deputizing you to help me arrest Augustine Spencer for assault. The Fosters refused because the battle lines had been drawn and anybody working on official church or city business was no friend of these guys. Joe walked up behind them and ordered them to help, but they refused to be deputized again. The argument became heated and Charles Foster drew his pistol and aimed it at Joseph Smith's chest in broad daylight on Main Street in Nauvoo. Joe's bodyguard, Porter Rockwell, grabbed the gun, disarmed Charles, and saved Joe's life. Charles shouted that if Porter hadn't stopped him, 
he would have killed Joe and felt like a hero for, quote, ridding the world of a tyrant, end quote. That time would come, Charles Foster, but not yet. Just not quite yet, old Chucky boy. In a very contentious court hearing over this incident, the Fosters and the Higbees were convicted of disturbing the, the peace, and they were fined $100. After the trial, Joe basically told Robert Foster that if he didn't shut his mouth, his blood would be spilled. All of these things were spiraling out of control for Joseph Smith. He's unable to control all of the dissent from within the ranks, and he cannot retain control over these dissenters. And in a private meeting of the Council of 50, Joe declared, quote, that, the Fo that Foster and the Higbees were all given to the buffetings of Satan, end quote. He cashiered Robert Foster from the Nauvoo Legion and nullified all land contracts with his name on them, putting pressure on the Fosters to simply cut their losses and leave the city. Well, they didn't, at least not yet. These dissenters weren't going to take all of this abuse from the prophet lying down. On May 7, 1844, Joe recorded a momentous event in his journal. Quote, An opposition printing press arrived at Dr. Robert D. Foster's from Columbus, Ohio. End quote. This was the printing press for the Nauvoo Expositor, a newspaper the dissenters founded in order to expose Joseph Smith and publish his crimes to the world. Let's just say Joseph Smith could hold a grudge. The Nauvoo Expositor published only one issue, dated June 7th, 1844, and it revealed some details of Joe's secret practice of polygamy, and it also denounced Joe's interference in politics and his tyrannical style of church governance. It also served as a charter for a new church that they founded called the True Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to both compete with Joe's church and to provide a safe haven and outlet for fellow Mormon dissenters. Notably, the Council of Fifty had their final meeting before Joe and Hiram's deaths on May 31st, 1842, while the Nauvoo Expositor was being printed, and would soon to be published on June 7th. Page after page in the Council of Fifty Minute book kept by William Clayton, you know, William Clayton, we call him William Clayton, Page after page are filled with treasonous screeds about the overthrow of the government. And one of the stated purposes of the Nauvoo Expositor was to show the world how much power Joseph Smith had gained and how dangerous of a man he really was. No single document detailed his power and his ultimate goals, and more importantly, his true intentions, more than the Council of Fifty Minutes. These are the same minutes that Joe would instruct Quilliam Claypen to burn or bury as Joe was being hauled off to the Carthage jail. The day the Nauvoo Expositor was published and disseminated, the city council was in almost constant meetings about how to handle the situation. At this meeting, Joe and Hiram Smith leveled a bunch of accusations against William Law, including that he was a counterfeiter, that he maliciously forced Joe to pay a $40 debt that he owed him, that he had brought uh, a whore from Canada, that he had confessed to adultery, that he had offered to pay Joseph Jackson $500 to assassinate Joseph Smith, that he had betrayed Joe to a band of Missourians. They also claimed that Francis Higby had a sexually transmitted disease and that Joseph Jackson was also trying to borrow money, had stolen some jewelry, and had tried to recruit people into his counterfeiting business. Most of these allegations were straight up lies, and a lot of them were actually true about Joseph Smith, which is kind of a really weird kind of established universe, you know, flip-flop kind of world to view this through. But... There were enough half-truths in all of this that it's really hard to distinguish the fact from fiction. And the intention behind it all, of course, like, it's just to justify the decision that they had already made, which was to di silence the dissenter's right to free speech by fascist and tyrannical decree. Finally, Joe suggested the city council pass an ordinance to prevent libelous publication and conspiracy against the peace of the city. And two days later, the council passed a law and declared the expositor a public nuisance and ordered the printing press destroyed. One thing Joseph Smith said during this meeting that proved to be quite prophetic was this, quote, he would rather die tomorrow and have the thing smashed, the novel expositor, than to live and have it go on, end quote. 
I have never seen a prophecy from Joseph Smith come true so spectacularly and so accurately and timely as this one prophecy. And equally prophetic was a warning from Francis Higby, quote, the inhabitants of this city is done the minute a hand is laid on this press, end quote. The council ignored this warning, and Joe immediately dispatched an order to city marshal John P. Green to destroy the printing press. Joe also called out Major General Jonathan Dunham with the entire Nauvoo Legion in order to quell any unrest that would result from burning the printing press. That very evening, dozens, maybe even hundreds of men stormed the expositor office, destroyed it, burned the printing press, and probably stole some property while they were at it. Episode 202. Resentment against the Mormons had been brewing in nearby non-Mormon towns for years by this point. In January 1844, there had been a brawl in the non-Mormon town of Carthage, just south of Nauvoo, when Nauvoo constables showed up there to arrest a guy named Milton Cook on a bastardy charge, a lot of what, which is modern-day abandonment. Now, a lot of non-Mormons who believed that the Nauvoo legal system was completely corrupt had turned out to prevent the Nauvoo constables from arresting Milton Cook. A couple of days later, the citizens of Carthage held a public meeting presided over by an Illinois militia colonel named Levi Williams, in which they resolved to organize themselves into companies of Minutemen to defend Carthage from any aggression by Mormon forces from Nauvoo. In the newspaper of nearby Warsaw, Illinois, published by Thomas Coke Sharp, Thomas C. Sharp, the Warsaw Signal, there ensued a lively debate between various editorialists about whether some kind of compromise with the Mormons might be desirable or whether the Mormons should just be driven from the state, as had happened in Missouri just six years prior. That resentment finally spilled over after the destruction of the Expositor Press. The Warsaw Signal by Thomas Sharp issued numerous daily extras covering every piece of intel they received about the city council meetings and the destruction of the press under headlines like unparalleled outrage at Nauvoo. Thomas Sharp was outraged, but his articles merely captured the prevailing outrage ruling the non-Mormon settlements bordering Nauvoo. Here's Sharp's commentary on the event from the Warsaw Signal, quote, We have only to state that this is sufficient. War and extermination is inevitable. Citizens arise, one and all. Can you stand by and suffer such infernal devils to rob men of their property and rights without avenging them? We have no time for comment. Every man will make his own. Let it be made with powder and ball. End quote. Joe and Hiram Smith responded to this issue of the Thomas Sharp's paper, the Warsaw Signal, by offering a reward for the destruction of the printing press, the Warsaw Signal, which was apparently no idle threat because it just happened with the Nauvoo Expositor. And of course, they do the same thing to the Warsaw Signal. And that threat, of course, didn't do anything to settle down the situation. If they were going to burn the Nauvoo Expositor printing press, why would they stop there? Who knows how this would all react? Who knows? These, these, there are more powder kegs. The whole state of Illinois, all of Adams County and, and Hancock County, they were sitting on powder kegs. This was dangerous. It was on the precipice of civil war. Now, the anti-Mormon party, of which Thomas Sharp was one of the founders, they met the evening after the expositor was burned to try and deliberate about how to handle this issue. The meeting resolved, among other things, quote, that the time, in our opinion, has arrived when the adherents of Smith as a body should be driven from the surrounding settlements into Nauvoo, consolidating them, right? That the prophet and his miscreant adherents should then be demanded at their hands, and if not surrendered, a war of extermination should be waged to the entire destruction, if necessary, for our protection of its adherents, end quote. Once again, hearkening back to that old militant language that was originally employed by Hingeman Sidney Rigdon himself. Really coming back to bite him. 
This anti-Mormon committee resolved to send this resolution to Governor Thomas Ford. The logic was to consolidate all the Mormons into in the nearby settlements into Nauvoo, after which the Illinois militia forces would have a much easier time of laying siege to the city until surrender could be effected and the Mormons could be removed from Illinois wholesale like it happened in Missouri. And there are many dark echoes of Missouri happening here. The people of Illinois had initially welcomed the Warrens with open arms and felt sympathy for all the persecution that they had suffered in Missouri. But now, just a few months shy of six years later, the Illinoisans were fed up with the Mormons and they were ready to hit the replay button on the whole Mormon war all over again. Back in Nauvoo. Joe was up to his usual machinations to get off the hook. He agreed to be arrested by a city officer from Carthage, David Bettisworth, but, of course, he used his right of habeas corpus to have the case heard by a Mormon court in Nauvoo. Constable Bettisworth wasn't happy about this, of course, but he complied with the order, because if he didn't, then the Danites would be on him, and the Nauvoo court's proceedings and the verdict were exactly what you'd expect. Joe was exonerated, because, of course, he was. He could do no wrong. He was their supreme leader. This time, though... Joe's legal hijinks weren't going to be enough. He was a slippery guy when it came to the law, but that luck and prowess was bound to run out eventually. The anti-Mormons were ready to flip over the game board with this latest outrage. Now, people can only tolerate so many scandals and outrages before they completely revolt and say enough is enough and march and burn and destroy and eat the rich. <laughs> The Mormons and the anti-Mormons both sent a flurry of letters to Illinois Governor Thomas Ford, but the anti-Mormons weren't going to wait for approval from the governor himself to act. The citizens of Carthage held a bunch of training exercises for their militia while they were gathering forces, and the citizens of Warsaw, Warsaw shipped in crates of armaments to Carthage. 30 miles south of Nauvoo was the Morley settlement, known as Yelram, because Yelram is morally backwards, and Mormons are super clever with their nicknames. And the anti-Mormons delivered an ultimatum to the settlement citizens that they could either enlist to help take Joe into custody or give up their armaments and evacuate the settlement. The anti-Mormons gave the Mormons in Yelram 24 hours to decide. Joseph Smith was many things. Stupid wasn't one of them. He knew that this time he had stepped in it, that this was big trouble. But he also knew that he was in a strong position. He had 3,500 armed men at his disposal. He ordered out the Nauvoo Legion and put the city under martial law. And he sent letters asking for reinforcements from other Mormon communities, including Yelram. Joe knew things were getting too hot. So he tried to put Hiram and his family on a steamboat to Cincinnati so that Hiram could meet with the president seeking help and eventually live to avenge Joe's blood if he were killed. Hiram refused to go. Joe also sent away Hingeman Sidney Rigdon to provide for continuity of leadership. Rigdon, really, Rigdon was Joe's preemptive successor as well as his vice presidential candidate at this time. Although, of course, Brigham Young would later usurp that role in a dramatic public display that's far outside the scope of this podcast. If we take a step back, what was Governor Ford to do in this situation? Obviously, his first priority was to keep the peace among the citizens of his state. He also knew the Nauvoo Legion had more men, more guns, more supplies than the Illinois State Militia did. So an all-out war would likely be a losing proposition for him. Besides, the Mormons could subsist through a pro prolonged war by raiding and pillaging local non-Mormon settlements like they had done in Missouri. Not only did Joe and the Mormons learn a lot from their Missouri experience, but Governor Ford learned a lot from their Missouri experience as well. So Governor Ford decided to go to Carthage to see for himself what was going on and to see if he could defuse the situation in person. Now, he wouldn't repeat the mistakes of Governor Boggs and end up bedridden for the rest of his life from an assassin's gunshot. He needed to handle matters personally. His plan was to try Joe before a court-martial of the state militia for, quote-unquote, unofficerly conduct. The charge was designed to sound non-threatening, but the reality is that a court-martial technically had the authority to execute Joseph Smith on the spot if it found him guilty of treason. Joseph Smith was an official military commander of a state-sanctioned militia. In case you're wondering, yes... Joe was absolutely guilty of treason by sedition. 
had he stood trial for the charges at hand via a court martial, he would have been executed immediately. But a vigilante mob took control of the situation before such a verdict could be reached by a court martial. Governor Ford's arrival in Carthage on the 21st of June was widely celebrated by the anti Mormons, expecting that the law would finally be enforced for a change. Ford exchanged letters with Joe and he set up his officers in tents around the city and sent out spies, liaisons, throughout all of Hancock and Adams counties. Ford realized the immediacy and danger of the situation once he spent time talking to citizens in Carthage and receiving intel from all around the counties about what was going on. He stationed militia units at Carthage and at Warsaw, partially because there was the outstanding threat to the Warsaw Signal, Thomas Sharp's printing press, and he didn't want it to share a similar fate as the Nauvoo Expositor. So Joe hit the governor with a barrage of propaganda, including letters laying out the Mormon's case and all the accompanying affidavits about acts of violence that were committed by the anti-Mormons. In addition to prov like proving his own innocence and the deceit of his enemies, Joe also hoped to show the governor that it would be way too dangerous for Joe to come to Carthage for a court-martial. Carthage... <laughs> Carthage had been dealing with Mormon lawlessness in general for half a decade by this point. So Joe was right to be suspect of Ford's ability to keep him safe in any capacity, court-martial or otherwise. Governor Ford replied to Joe. He laid out the facts of the case as he understood them, which turned out to be quite accurate. And he expressed his opinion, quote, that your conduct in the destruction of the Nauvoo Expositor Press was a very gross outrage upon the laws and the liberties of the people. It may have been full of libels, but this did not authorize you to destroy it. End quote. In addition to violating the constitutional right to free speech and the protection against unreasonable search and seizure, Joe had also abused the concept of habeas corpus. Quote, in the particular case now under consideration, I require any and all of you who are or shall be accused to submit yourselves to be arrested by the same constable by virtue of the same warrant and be tried before the same magistrate whose authority has heretofore been resisted. Nothing short of this can vindicate the dignity of violated law and allay the just excitement of the people." End quote. Anything short of complying with that original arrest warrant might lead to civil war, and Ford refused to order the state militia to defend the saints if they remained in defiance of the law. Notably as well, this letter, it nullified Joe's Nauvoo Municipal Court hearing that exonerated him of all those initial charges for which Constable Bettesworth tried to charge him to begin with, or to arrest him for to begin with. Ford, Governor Ford, chose his battlefield and simply ignoring Joe's corruption in addition to all of the alleged crimes, that was clearly the easiest path to simply get Joe into state custody in Carthage. Joe replied with a letter that tried to refute Ford's letter point by point. He you know, tried to uh, he attempted to point to legal uh, precedents for the destruction of the printing press, declaring that it was a, uh, a nuisance, and then he refused to come to Carthage for trial. Quote, the appearance of the mob forbids our coming. We dare not do it, end quote. In the history of the church, Joe recorded Governor Ford's reaction to the letter uh, as it was read to him by John Taylor, quote, he treated our delegates very rudely. My communications were read to him. Uh, sorry, my communications that were read to him were read in the presence of a large number of our worst enemies who interrupted the reader at almost every line with, that's a damned lie and that's a goddamned lie. He never accorded to them the privilege of saying one word to him only in the midst of such interruptions as, you lie like hell from a crowd of persons present. These facts show conclusively that Ford is under the influence of the mob spirit and is designedly intending to place us in the hands of murderous assassins and is conniving at our destruction or else that he is so ignorant and stupid that he does not understand the corrupt and diabolical spirits that are around him, end quote. So the governor refused to accept Joe's arguments, which made him either evil or stupid in Joe's opinion. For his part, 
the governor believed that Joe was a damned liar. And, well, Governor Ford wasn't wrong. Joe surrendered days after the deadline that Ford had directed, and Joe was interred in Carthage jail on charges of riot and treason. This was his home for the short remainder of his life. He will only leave this earth as a legend. The only way to never die. What we do with anger says a lot about us as individuals. We lash out, you know, react in the moment. We cry, yell, we hit, we scream, we kick, we inflict harm to answer the perceived harm that we suffer. Some of us, however, don't react in the moment. Or maybe we do, but we put just a little bit of that anger in a reserve tank for when we need it later. When everything in the world is God's design, each slight against you is the work of the adversary. A person accumulates enough of these difficulties, and every person who opposes them is Satan incarnate. A God complex is soon to follow. To my enemies, you stand for everything that I live to cleanse, and I will see you on the battlefield. R.I.P. Mitch Lucker. Now, what our anger causes us to do teaches us about ourselves. The actions which result from our wrath teaches us even more. We can channel that deep emotion to accomplish all sorts of things, but what fruit comes from the tree of wrath? This brings us to our central question when we examine Joe's anger and his wrath, his intent and his endgame. Everything we discuss today hinges on the question of intent. From its inception, Mormonism sought to be the final religious revolution the world would need before the second coming of Jesus. That intent would result in the purification of all heretics from corporeal existence, which is just a pleasant way to say genocide. Genocide of all those who choose to not believe in a totalitarian religious theocracy. Those not drenched in the cleansing blood of the Savior shall be marked as infidels and die. The conviction of religious identity and superiority is what drove this idea and this mindset, this entire intent. But luckily for Joseph Smith, his wrath could be expressed as the divine and holy will of the Almighty God, never to be questioned, only to be complied with or fall to the overwhelming power of the wrathful arm of the divine. We spent so much time talking about Joseph Smith, you know, his early years in Palmyra and Harmony and treasure digging and, you know, that stuff. But all that completely ignores the path upon which he placed himself in that process. Joseph Smith didn't see himself just as a revolutionary, but the final revolutionary that would bring the whole goddamn world to its knees. He regarded himself happily. He revered himself as a Muhammad, as a Bonaparte, and finally as a savior unto himself. Episode 170 of this podcast envisioned a dystopian future of Mormon theocracy where the prophet accomplished his greatest designs. Compliance with his designs was the only acceptable option. The alternative resulted in warfare, bloodshed, and assassinations. Joe was a bloodthirsty and wrathful tyrant with misanthropic and elitist motives. When the idea for this podcast was gestating like six years ago now, wrath was a motivating and powerful motivating force in my life. I was wronged by Mormonism. It gave me a life I never signed up for. It robbed me of my humanity. It repressed my deepest human tendencies, and only a scorched earth would absolve this religion of its guilt. The catharsis that I've experienced resulting from having a productive outlet for that wrath, it's incredible. People who don't have the tools available to them to process their grief and their anger, they devolve into a vicious cycle of dread and loathing and misanthropy and wrath for what makes us human. We embrace our humanity and we become the best versions of ourselves, the most complete versions of ourselves. Joseph Smith never had a healthy or productive outlet for his wrath. As a result, everything that he did was an expression of that caustic and ugly side 
of his humanity. Now, if you will excuse me, I have a worldwide religion to bring to its knees. Time to burn it the fuck down with truth. This podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager. Music is written and produced by Jason Camo of a lost state of mind dot bandcamp dot com and used with permission. Legal counsel is provided by Andrew Torres of the Law Offices of P. Andrew Torres in the Opening Arguments podcast. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes LLC. Copyright twenty twenty. All rights reserved. <laughs>